to be seated, everyone. Good morning. We're back on record in State versus Brian Smith, case number BAN 199901 CR. Mr. Smith is here, counselor here, and um, we distributed the letter. I think we distributed it late yesterday. The, the letter under which the uh, Department of Law declined to grant immunity. Yes, you got I, that, Mr. Tello? I got it. Thank you. I, I think based on uh, the circumstances here, the court's already found that Mr. Calhoun has a valid Fifth Amendment. Yeah. Um, the state will not grant him immunity. He cannot be compelled to testify. Uh, we request that, that he be released from subpoena. Any reason I shouldn't do that, counsel? At this point, no. No, Judge. Okay. He is released. Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. Let me take a moment and read this, what I was just handed. What those are, judges, two stipulations. Um, the one that just says stipulation on the top is proposed by the state and agreed to by the defense. We'd ask that you read that at the end of Detective Lee's testimony today before the state rests. And then the other one says stipulation, I think, of the parties. That's proposed by the defense, agreed upon by us. We'd ask that you just read that in the defense case. So the one that relates to the DOC is for the defense case, yes. and the other one is to be read after Detective Lee testifies? Correct. Okay. I'm happy to do that. Um, okay, anything else we need to deal with at the outset of the day? I believe so, Judge. No. Let's bring the jury in. Oh, there is one thing. Sorry. Okay. And it's for after the next witness. So when Detective Lee testifies, sorry, every time you excuse them, I, I think of something. We have two short videos that are, or I'm sorry, seven short videos. They are only two that show her though, right? If you're talking about the body, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We have some very short snippets of videos that are seconds at most um, that depict Veronica Abichuk. In those videos, they'll be played about the middle of Detective Lee's testimony. Um, those videos show her, some she's sleeping on the couch and they don't, um, they don't show anything graphic. They're are two that are after she's on the floor, deceased. She's naked from the, well, she's, she, her head is covered. She's got a bra top on, but is otherwise naked on the floor. Um, those videos, I think it's inappropriate to have the media film or to be on the live stream um, because they are going to be integrated into Detective Lee's testimony. My proposal is that we essentially not have that part videoed on the live stream. We've thought of a very low tech solution. Um, it's, you know, what we used to do in the old days when we had the projector, just put something in front of that camera and we practice that today. And I think that that would work. Um, otherwise, it's a stop have IT cut the live stream, put it back on. And I think that the testimony is fine to be on the live stream, just the video itself probably isn't appropriate to be on the internet. So I would just ask for a protective order that the media not film those films. Those two photographs. Those are, two, Are they yes. still shots? There's, there's still shots that go along with them as well as videos. It'll be obvious when we get to that part. But it's a combination of still shots and videos. Um, they're seconds in length, but they are necessary to stop and look at and point out evidentiary items in the scene. Um, so I would ask that when those videos and still shots are played, the media doesn't photograph them and that we cover the camera that, that projects onto that television or onto the witness stand. 
Okay. Any response from the defense first? Yeah, good. Uh, okay, <clears throat> my, my previous rationale in this case for not displaying the, the other videos was that um, further public publication would compound the loss of dignity of the woman in the videos. And um, it sounds, I haven't seen these photographs, but, but it sounds to me like based on the description that's been given, it sounds to me like the same rationale applies to those two photographs. I, I haven't entered judge uh, orders that relate to the portrayal of bodies in general, for example. Um, it was the particular way the bodies were, bodies or people were um, portrayed in the, in the photos that blended itself to my, uh, my conclusion that they were, their display would further involve a loss of dignity. So, um, I, it, it sounds to me like the same rationale applies here. So I will enter that or that protective order. We won't turn, we won't prevent the gallery or or anyone in the courtroom from seeing what is being described and, and what is being shown to the jury. But I will direct that there be no filming of the only partially clothed body of a person that is alleged to be a victim. And I understand that's only two photographs or two. Are there videos as well? There's videos that accompany those photographs and it's their pieces. Go ahead, Ms. Snow. Yeah, there's two videos, Judge. And um, out of the seven videos, I believe, that show uh, the full, um, that show the images that Ms. Dunlop described, there is a still shot image from the videos that I will be using as an exhibit. I've actually, though, put, uh, tried to put some add some dignity to that photo and block out portions of that photo. Um, okay. So that particular photo, I think, is has been, I've take, taken means to protect um, the dignity of the victim in that particular photo when we're talking about it and have it up on the screen. But it's the two videos specifically that we play. I will, I'll have so, to. So uh, what I'm, what I'm mulling over now is how will I know when that's about to happen? May we approach? I'll yes. show you the images. So, this is the still shot that's taken from the video. So you can see her kind of ways down, but there's obviously items of evidentiary interest in the video. When Ms. Nabraga is going to be just talking about it more at length, she's done that. Does that make sense? So it's three twenty-five C. It does, and that's also an exhibit. So three twenty-five. So the jury can compare. Yep, and three twenty-five C is the video, and then three twenty-five D is the video. All these three twenty-five C D E are all the videos, and we basically when we get to that um, drive around the yes of the house, this one more. Okay, ask, thank and we'll you. Just, I'll just pass the Ms. Nabraka just tentatively for the time. We're done. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So you, you've got the, you've got, got it worked out when, when this will occur during your examination. I do. I have to double, I have to mark which ones are the worth of the seven. I didn't have to figure out. So if you want the non, non, if there's these videos where she's mostly clothed, I don't know that we need to react I, for those. I understand. And I, I, I agree. Uh, 
No position. Okay. Uh, having seen the photos in question, my uh, my decision it reinforces my decision. The particular way the shots were taken it raised the same concerns that I addressed earlier. Um, so no no filming of. Um, partially clothed or I guess we I'll just say no filming of the partially clothed body of the alleged victim and uh, we will block the transmission of, of the screen during that portion anything else we need to address before we bring the jury in yes as they describe it. Well, the uh, the it'll be displayed directly behind the witness. Oh, right. If you can arrange it so that you can focus just on the witness's face and not on the background behind it, I'm not prohibiting that. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're ready for the jury. Thank you. Please be seated, everyone. Welcome back, folks. We've got our jury back with us. It's about a quarter to nine. No, it's four minutes to nine. And um, we do have everyone here that we need to have here in order to proceed with the Brian Smith trial. And folks, I, I wanted to let you know that we are very much on schedule or even ahead of the schedule that we posited for you at the beginning of the trial. So uh, it doesn't look like we'll have to go long. And you'll have to take as long as you take once you're in deliberations, but uh, we're, we're well on schedule too to finish on time or before we estimated. Uh, before we broke, we I think we'd finished up with another witness, another state's witness, and so we're ready to hear from the next witness. Thank you, Judge. We'll get um, Paul Dinks from the hallway. Up here next to me, please, sir. Morning. Please remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Sir, do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give in this case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but Yes, I do. Thank you, Number two. Sir, for the record, can you say your first and last name is Paul The name is Paul Inks, P A U L I N K S. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, can you introduce yourself to the jury and tell them um, what you did for the APD? Okay. Um, as I said, I'm Paul Inks. I worked for the Anchorage Police Department for 25 years in the crime lab, and I had various positions there. I started out in photography and then moved into evidence processing and finished up in uh, latent print examination. And I retired about a year and a half, almost two years ago. Okay. And can you tell the jury about some of the training and experience you had to be a latent print examiner? We had uh, training within the lab that uh, would get you kind of started, and then they would send us out to training uh, maybe at the state crime lab or even up or down to lower 48 or some training down there where they, you know, expose you to palm prints and difficult prints and uh, overlapping prints and things like that. Did you attend? Um, training outside of the the APD or the state crime lab? Yes, I went down to some conferences in the lower 48. And how long was it that you were working on latent prints for the for the crime lab? Oh, I think less than four years, maybe three years. And then um, before that, you did evidence processing and photography, is that right? I did evidence processing for about 12 years, maybe, 11 to 12 years. And then I did manage the photography department for about 10 years. Okay. Can you, in that course of time that you were doing latent prints, um, about how many do you think you examined? 
<laughs> oh, I have no idea. I did keep track like the first year or so, and I think I made about 250 identifications in that year. So, And you did that for four or five years? Well, I would say three to four. Three to four. Were you ever called upon to testify as to your work in latent print examinations? I've uh, Two times I've been qualified as an expert in latent print examinations. At this point, Judge, I would ask to qualify um, Mr. Inks in the field of latent print examinations. No objection. He, the court recognizes him as an expert in that field. Okay. And when did you retire from the APD? Uh, was it April of 22? Okay. So a couple of years now? Yeah, a couple of years. Okay. And can you explain when you were there, the process for working latent prints, how they came to you, how you made decisions about what to test first? Okay. They could actually come in a variety of different methods. They could come in as... Um, uh, fingerprints were lifted from scene by uh, powdering it and putting a piece of tape on it, lifting it off and putting it on a card. Uh, so they'll come in in that method. They can come in um, just in photographs or they could come in on a piece of evidence and they could ask us to process that evidence and find additional fingerprints. So there's a variety of ways that they could come in. So I could submit uh, this to you and say, can you find it? Or I could be out on the scene myself and lift it or photograph it and send it in. Correct. Okay. Um, and you take those um, requests from the investigators that are actually at the scene? Um, it could be the investigators or it could be uh, a police officer that showed up and was processing the scene. So it could be an officer, detective, usually a sworn personnel. Okay. And then... Um, if they have lifted prints for you to examine, what then was the, the process that you underwent to decide if something, you know, had sufficient detail to be worth looking at closer? Uh, the lift cards would come in and then we'd sit down and, and determine how many we had. If there was anything on the card that was of value, uh, if a print was found on a card that was value for comparison, then we'd have to determine is it something we compare or is it good enough quality that we can run it through a, a computer system and search a nationwide database. If there's a fairly good quality print, then we could submit it into what's called the APHIS system. And uh, the name has changed now, but it was APHIS at that time. And uh, it would come back with a list of candidates. And then the examiner would sit down and look at those candidates and determine if there was a match between the two. Um, if it wasn't good enough for APHIS, then we'd have to wait for um, the detective or case investigator to submit names to us. And if we receive a list of names, then we could go through that list and compare those prints to that, those uh, 10 print cards. Okay. Um, were you asked to review prints lifted and items taken from a Black Ford Ranger in case, APD case 1935212? Um, we had lift cards come in on that case. I think they're from a rear view mirror. I don't remember if it was a Ford Ranger or not. But okay. I could refer to my report and verify okay. that. If it'll refresh your recollection to look at the report, I don't know that the report actually says what kind of vehicle, but did they come in from a Detective Aldridge? Yes, they did. Okay. And approximately how many latent print fingerprint cards did you get from? There were 16 latent fingerprint cards, and we determined that there were three that had um, sufficient ridge detail for a comparison. Okay. And two of them were good enough for APHIS. Okay, so of those of those 16, only three could, could be compared to anything and only two were sufficient to go into APHIS? Yes. Okay. Is that uncommon that detectives will lift things and they're just not enough to make an ID? No, we've had 50 or 60 cards turned in and nothing of value is on them at all. So it's, Fairly common to not have anything on the cards. Okay. And when you're deciding if something is good enough to put into APHIS or good enough to make a comparison, what factors are you looking for? Uh, we're looking for a general um, ridge flow, a pattern shape. That's one of the uh, characteristics the system looks for. And then we're looking for features within the print that uh, the system can identify, like where a ridge is flowing along and it just stops or a ridge, um, what they call bifurcate, it'll change from one ridge into two ridges, or looking for maybe a little place where a ridge pops up between two other ridges, we're looking for features like that. We can 
put in the system and then it'll compare that to what's out in the, the larger database. Okay. And is that an examination that you are doing personally by hand or by eye, I suppose? It would be if the person putting in an AFIS system would, would make those, um, find those features and characteristics and mark them. So um, of just overall, when you got 16 lift cards from, um, from Detective Aldridge, where were those from? I'm not sure where they all came from. Um, if it'll refresh your recollection, go ahead and look at page one of eight of your report. Looks like they're from a variety of places, some from a stereo, some from a mirror instead of a car, some from a bottle. Most of them look like they're from a vehicle. Okay, go ahead and list the places that they came from. Okay. Um, it was recorded on, they record a card where they lifted it from. So it's, the first card was says L half of stereo touch screen from AK um, FSL 878. Uh, the second card was uh, R half of stereo touch screen AK uh, license FSL 878. The third card was uh, D1 driver's door near B pillar. Um, fourth card was D2 lower driver's door B near B pillar. The next card was D2 continued lower driver's side door near B pillar. Um, next one was P1 passenger side door, or passenger door near B pillar. The next one would be vanity mirror, passenger sun visor, AK license FSL 878. And was that the first one you found sufficient rich detail? Well, that was the first one out of that grouping that had, it was marked L2. Um, ocean spray bottle left side as facing, um, ocean spray bottle right side as facing. Next card, vanity mirrors, uh, passengers, sun visor, AK, uh, license FSL 878. And that was where we found, or, Mark the one L1 of value. Um, next card was mouth was left side as facing. Um, next card was R side of rear view mirror. Next card was lower center of rear view mirror. Next card was passenger side window, uh, AK license FSL 878. Next card was windshield interior, and the last card was right side of rear view mirror, and that was uh, had a latent we marked L3 as sufficient. Okay, and that L3, was it sufficient to go into APHIS or just sufficient for comparison later? Sufficient for comparison. Okay, so you get these two that can go into L APHIS, L1 and L2. What do you do with that? So then um, we would take them into the computer system and scan them into it and uh, mark the features and then submit it. First, we search it in Alaska only. And if nothing comes back, then we'll submit it to a nationwide search. And uh, I believe L1 came back uh, with a um, hit on uh, both the state and the uh, national database. Okay. And when it has a hit, where does that database draw from? It's a FBI. Database. So somebody's really. fingerprints are system. Yeah. Okay. Do they give you a name or anything at that point? They give us a number and then we take that number and go look it up and figure out what the name is that's associated with it. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as state exhibits 340 through 342. Just a cover page, and then these are front and back. So okay. 340, 341, 342. Um, let's start with 340. What is 340? 340 is a uh, photograph showing 
all the sides of the uh, lift card that was turned in of the vanity mirror, passenger, sun visor, AL license, FSL uh, 878. Okay. It shows the front of the card and uh, the back of the card with where I marked L1. Okay. So this is the um, card as submitted by Detective Aldridge and then marked on by you? Correct. Okay. I'd move at this point for the admission of 340. No objection. Admitted. Thank you. So when you're looking at this, um, this, so this is the lift card from Detective Aldridge, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so he says this came from the vanity mirror and the passenger sun visor. Yeah, right here. Okay, and he's got the license plate of the truck on there. When you're looking at this, what is it about it that tells you there's sufficient detail to compare? Okay, first, if you look at this print here, um, you can see there's kind of a circling pattern. We call this a whorl, so we know basically like what pattern print it is. Then we'll go in and look for features within it to see if there's something we can use. And if you follow these ridges, you'll see this one comes down, stops, this one goes up and stops. And let's go through there and find all those features. And then we take that and scan it into the computer and mark those characteristics and then send it off to the database to send us back a candidate list. Okay. And then once you get that candidate list, is it a uh, hand like a an individualized process to review them? Yes. So we go pull the one that so we'd look at it on the computer and say, well, that one looks pretty good. So we go grab the actual um, prints if we have them on file. If we don't have them within the state, then we can print them out from the national database. And we'll go back to our desk and sit down and um, get them larger and, and look at them uh, with a little bit more detail. Okay. So go ahead and turn to 341. It should be on the back of 340. Um, what is 341? 341 would be the uh, print where I've taken it back to my desk and made markings on it to show the similarities in the print. Okay. So are the red markings there dots that you have put on it? Yes. Okay, and the second two photos are those. So the first photo, is that the, the print that was lifted from the truck? I'm not showing. Sure. I'm but, not showing it. Yeah, this, um, yeah, the first photo here would be the print lifted from the truck that I marked. And then the second two photos are the comparison and then the comparison that you marked? Yes, well, the second one would be the actual, the full image that was on the lift card, or not the lift card, the 10 print card, and then the... Uh, Third image would be the a cropped area of that with the markings. Okay, and those are true and accurate um, records as you used that um, at the APD crime lab. Correct. Okay, I'd move at point this point for the admission of three forty one. Okay. Admitted. And um, who's right? Whose print card did you use to pull the image in the middle? It's a Wharton. Okay. And I think later in your documentation, it's a Sonia Wharton. Yes. Is that correct? And you um, get her like state ID number and all those things along with the set. Yeah. Print. Came back with both her FBI number and a state ID number. Okay. She's hitting both databases. Okay. So the middle is the known print of Sonia Wharton. Mm -hmm. The left is the print lifted from the truck. And then the right is the known print blown up. So you could look at areas of concurrence. Yes. Okay, so explain to the jury what you're doing, what you see that matches and how you can tell this fingerprint is different from mine or yours or anybody else's. Okay. In the um, first, we just kind of look at a general overall. Do we have a similar pattern? If you look at this one versus that one over there, you'll see you do have basically a, a what we call a world pattern to it. And once we've determined that, then we can go in and start finding these individual features. And as I pointed out earlier, you got this ridge that curves around and comes down the stop. You go over it there, you find the same curves around stops. And then the ridge right next to it goes up and stops and it goes up and stops. So you just go through and find all these different features in there. Now, when you get off to the side here, this area here is a smudge and you get your, your skin is flexible and it moves, and so sometimes the information gets unreliable out here. So 
we tend to avoid those areas. But you can go through and find these um, different features and different characteristics in the print. Okay, so it sounds like you look at the overall pattern first, you called this a whirl? Yes. What other types of patterns are there? There's loops and arches, and then in those there's subcategories. The main three would be loops, arches, and whirls. So you start with the overall category and then you look for features within that category? Yeah. Is there a certain number that you have to have to make an identification? In our lab, we had a, a 10 features that we would require to make an identification. Okay. Do you know how many you found here? Over 10. Okay. And so how um, how confident are you that this print belongs to a Sonia Wharton and not somebody else? I believe it belongs to Sonia Wharton. Okay. And then is 342 just another up close version of that L1 print? Yes. Um, and so at this point for the admission of 342? No objection. Admit, <laughs> admitted. Okay. So understanding this print comes from a Sonia Wharton, does it tell you anything else about the case? Like other than her fingerprint went on the mirror in the sun visor. That's all it would tell me. At some point, she touched the mirror. Okay. Um, I don't know when. You don't know when. You don't know why she was in the vehicle or who asked her to get in the vehicle or anything like that. Or even if she was in the I mean, you could reach in and touch it too. So I don't know anything other than there's a, her finger was on that. I yeah. touched that at some point. Understood. So I'm going to move past the fingerprints and ask you about some other works that the APD crime lab was asked to do in this case. Um, were you provided on November 13th, or I'm sorry, did you generate a report on November 13th, 2019 about um, a number of items referred to you from a Detective Harry Straley? Yes, we received a request from Detective Straley to process uh, several items, um, four fingerprints and and then submit a report to him. Okay. And can you tell the jury what items he asked you to process? Um, and we'll kind of go through them one at a time and say whether or not you were able to do anything with it. Okay. okay. That'll take, I'll refer back to my notes too. But. Sure, if it'll refresh your recollection. Um, the first item on his list was a uh, thumb drives, and um, there were like 15 electronic storage devices in maybe a smaller bag. Um, and did those have a evidence tag number on them? They did. What was that tag, tag number? Was one one seven two zero four five. And um, what were you able to do with those um, with those devices? Um, in one of the chemical processes, I saw some ridge detail, but I determined it was um, of no value. Um, the next item was a PNY micro SD card. Is that correct? That's correct. And what was the tag number on that? The tag number is 1208324. Okay. And what were you able to do with that? Uh, I did a visual and a, a <coughs> chemical process on it, and there was no de ridge detail. Okay. The next item was a medicine packet, an empty medicine packet. Were you able to do anything with that? Um, in one of the processes, there was ridge detail that showed up, but I determined it was of no value. Um, there was a clothing tag. Were you able to do anything with that? Uh, the fabric we determined wasn't really a good surface for latent prints. Um, we just did a visual examination on it. Didn't see any obvious staining on it. And then I packaged it back up and submitted it to property. Okay. There was a luggage rag. Rat, uh, I'm sorry, a luggage rack base, a large rectangular surface of a luggage rack. What were you asked to do with that? Um, looks like we were looking for possible blood and maybe uh, fingerprints in blood on that. So I did a chemical process on it. Um, it all tested negative for blood. And then I didn't have any reaction with the chemical. And then there was a Clorox bottle. Yes. Um, what did you process that before? 
again, uh, as for fingerprints, um, there was um, some ridge detail that showed up, but nothing of value. There was some white PVC pipe um, labeled as a silencer. What um, did you process that for? Yeah, I processed that for latent fingerprints and then there's no ridge detail on it. Okay. Um, there was a wicked lemonade can. What did you process that for? Uh, the lemonade can, I swabbed the uh, spout area for possible DNA. Okay. And uh, then I did a fingerprint processing on it. I found uh, two fingerprints, labeled them L1 and L2, and I photographed them. Okay. Do you know if those were processed further beyond that? I do not. Okay. And the same with the DNA. Would that be up to the case detective to decide to send forward? Yeah. If they're going to do anything with it, they'd have to submit it to the state. Okay. And when you say the state, the state crime lab? State crime lab. Something outside of the APD's crime lab. Yeah. Okay. Um, there was a blue exam club. What did you do with that? There's a blue what? Exam oh, glove. Oh, exam glove. Okay. There's a couple other items in there too. Oh, did I skip? What it, What was I'm it? going by probably a different page than you are maybe. Okay. Are you looking at the key card? Key card. Okay. What did you do with the key card? Key card uh, processing for fingerprints and no ridge detail. There were two beer cans, a natural light can and a Kenai River brewing can. What did yes. you do with those? Those, again, I um, swabbed the spout area of both those cans for... DNA and submitted those tag numbers back to property evidence and then processed it for uh, latent fingerprints. And there was ridge detail on the Kenai River can and it was labeled L3 and photographed. Okay. Um, you don't know if additional processing was done beyond that? No. Okay. There were a couple of exam gloves, a clear exam glove and a blue exam glove. What did you do with those? Uh, the clear exam glove, I swabbed the glove in between the fingers and the interior, like the wrist area of the glove for DNA, uh, packaged that up and submitted it to property, did a processing for, uh, oh, there's some staining on the gloves, I uh, sampled it uh, for possible blood and it came back negative, and then I processed it for fingerprints and uh, there was no ridge detail on the gloves. Um, there was some ammunition, two nine millimeter um, pieces of ammunition and one forty caliber piece of ammunition. Yes. Which can you tell me the tag number that that ammunition was submitted under? Tag number is one two 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 one zero one. Okay. And what did you find on those? There was no ridge detail. Looking for fingerprints. And then there were two key cards. Yes. Um, what did you do with those? Process those for uh, fingerprints, and there was no ridge detail found. And then there were some three other exam gloves labeled A through C. What did you do with those? So, again, I swabbed those for possible DNA, um, submitted the um, swabs back to property, processed the gloves for um, fingerprints, and there was no ridge detail found. The last thing on this report, there was something else labeled as a silencer, an oil filter wrapped with duct tape. Um, what did you do with that? Process that for fingerprints and uh, no ridge detail file. Um, did you get a, an additional request for evidence processing um, from Detective Lee? I did for a black plastic trash bag. Okay, and what was the tag number on that? Tag number is 1156552. And what were you asked to do with that? Uh, please analyze for blood and swab if found, attempt to lift fingerprints. And did you, were you able to do that? Yeah, and I didn't find anything. Okay. So all this evidence that you attempted to get ridge detail off of or find fingerprints, when you don't, what do you do with it? Um, so it all goes back to property and evidence. We've already photographed the ones we did find evidence on or fingerprints on. And then um, sometimes we've already been asked to go ahead and uh, compare those. Other times we wait for a request to determine what to do with those fingerprints. And so the 
the match that you do have or the fingerprint that you could identify just to recap was a single print on the vanity mirror in the passenger side of the vehicle. And that came back to us on the Wharton. Yes. And that's from a lift card. Okay. I think that's all. That's all the questions I have for you. Thank you. Is there cross-examination? Very briefly, uh, I just want to take you back to a couple of the things you were asked just now. Um, if, I can, uh, if you need to go back to your report, that is fine. But you mentioned that you were asked to examine two uh, alleged silencers, right? Correct. For rich detail. Yes. Right. You were not asked to review them for the presence of blood or DNA. Okay. Let me look at my refer to my report on that. I'm looking at three of six for the white PGC pipe alleged silencer. Um, Detective Straley's requested um, examine for possible blood and swab if present. And if you go to page three of six, you say white PVC pipe silencer. Uh, your report on that is simply no RD, no RD, no RD, no RD, right? Right. I did a visual. The first step is a visual examination. And then same thing for, I can take you page six of six. Same thing with the oil filter alleged silencer, right? Correct. I did a visual examination and then processed it for fingerprints. Thank you. So I have. In all your time at the crime lab, sometimes do you try your best to find stuff without success? We try to find stuff. Most of the time we don't find anything. Okay. The evidence is what it is. Yeah. That's all the questions I have. We step down. Thank you. Thank you. Judge the state now calls the second lead. Did you previously sworn in the case, but it was long enough ago that I'm going to do it again. Sure. If I can have just a moment, Judge, just with I do. And so for the record, can you state your birth name? Yes, my name is Brendan Lee, B R E N D A N L E E. Whenever you're ready, Mr. Thank you, Judge. So, Detective Lee, um, <clears throat> when we last spoke, we had talked a little bit about the early uh, parts of the investigation in this particular case. And um, I believe we'd gotten up to kind of the, other than the, the conversations you'd had with Ms. Kasler, we'd gotten up to kind of the first full day of the investigation, correct? When you had, you said you had briefed the rest of the detectives and started working on the case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, so um, <clears throat> We talked about that uh, during your briefing, Detective Cordy and Detective Bell had given you information that led you to investigate Brian Smith, correct? Yes. Okay. And part of their investigation, the information that they provided you, I believe, re revolved a 2018 investigation. Is that correct? Yes, it did. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the 2018 investigation. Was Miss Alicia Youngblood the source of the information that led to that investigation by APD in 2018? Yes, she was. Did APD, did someone from APD, either you or other homicide detectives, reach back out to Ms. Youngblood in 2019 after the SD card was uh, turned into APD? Uh, yes, I did not, but other detectives did. And um, was Ms. Youngblood um, willing to continue to communicate with APD in 2019? Yes, she was. Did... Um, as part of your investigation, did you have access to that information she had provided in 2018 to the detectives back in 2018? 
Yes, I did. And did that include information uh, from her phone, cell phone records, text messages, et cetera? Yes, it did. And did that include text messages, et cetera, that she had had with uh, and conversations she'd had with Mr. Smith? Yes, it did. Did Ms. Youngbud uh, testify at grand jury in this case? Yes. Yeah, What's the objection? You may. Uh, to the extent there is an objection, it's overruled. Did Ms. Uh, Youngblood testify at the grand jury in this investigation? Yes, she did. Is she able to testify at trial? Uh, no, she's not. And why is that? Uh, she passed away in July of 2021. I want to talk further about uh, what else you did on the 1st of October. So the day after you uh, spoke initially to Ms. Kassler and obtained the SD card. In addition to doing a briefing um, with the detectives, what other, what other things did you do on the 1st of October? Um, so in addition to the briefing, at that in the briefing, um, we decided who would do what. Um, in, in the homicide unit, um, as you've heard, you have a case detective. And then you have all the other detectives that are there to help out with the other um, tasks that need to be done. Um, so it was decided that detectives uh, Cordy and Baker would start on writing affidavits for search warrants um, for Mr. Smith's um, residence and pickup truck and his cell phone um, information. Um, and then I'd also sent out um, detectives to the residence to see if the pickup truck was at the residence at the time. They did not see it initially when they went to the, to the residence outside of the residence. Um, we also sent detectives to um, the Spring Hill Suites, um, where we had learned that Mr. Smith was working at at the time, um, to see if they could see the pickup truck there as well. Um, and then um, when we did not see uh, the pickup truck or Mr. Smith at those places, um, I had a couple of officers in an undercover capacity um, sit outside of the residence to see if the pickup truck would return um, back to the residence. Did you also make attempts to um, identify the female in the videos? Yes, I did. And what were the, what did that involve? Um, so reviewing the videos is trying to get as much detail about the, the female's face and characteristics as I could. Um, in addition to looking into missing persons um, that, that could match the description or the height, weight, and, and race, that sort of thing. I reviewed um, APD databases, Tibron, um, which is an in-house APD database. Um, when we contact a person out on the street and we run them and we write a report about them, that information goes into Tibron. Um, I researched apps in NCIC and um, the DMV database trying to figure out who this female was. Did you or other um, detectives or Sergeant Cross also distribute images in an attempt to have others help identify? Yes, we did. And how do you do that? Um, so with the DMV uh, um, photographs that we collect of people that potentially could be the person in the video, um, we'll send out to say, well, first off, I'll take images from the video of the female's face and, and, and for that matter, of the pickup truck. And I send it out to patrol officers um, through email department wide to see if anybody recognized her, to see if anybody had contact with her recently might know her. And was that the images that um, uh, Tech Hunter provided to you? Yes, they were. Okay. And um, any other any other things that you did to try and um, see if anyone else might recognize either the truck or the female in, the, in those images? Um, yes. Yeah, so we um, showed the images to different places, such as Brother Francis or CSP, ASP, to see if anybody might have had contact with the recent. So that was the first uh, of October. Um, what, uh, so you knew some initials that I'm not sure the jury is going to be familiar with, CSP and ASP. Yeah, I apologize. So see, I said CSP, that's what it was in the old days, Community Service Patrol. Since then, they're now called Anchorage Safety Patrol. They're the, um, the folks, uh, I believe they're under AFD, um, under AFD's control, but they the go fire around. Department. Uh, yeah, okay. initials again, Anchorage Fire Department, and they go around and they pick up folks that are um, not in a, in a condition to be able to take care of themselves, intoxication or otherwise. Um, so then they, they have contact with a lot of, um, of people that are wandering around on the streets or out on the streets. So um, Im those images were shown to some of those folks to see if they possibly could recognize the female as well? Yes. Okay. I want to move on to then, um, is there anything else on the 1st of October that you did? Um, that you can recall? That I can recall, no. Okay. And then, so next day, October 2nd, um, we heard previously that um, 
the body along mile 108.5 was reported by the railroad um, to the Anchorage Police Department on October 2nd, correct? Yes. And were you aware of that uh, particular report? Uh, yes, I was. Okay. And we heard previously that uh, Detective Bell was assigned to that particular case. Yes, it was assigned a separate case number at, um, at the time we, we believed it to be a separate incident. We were not aware. So um, what else as that? That investigation was unfolding. What were you doing on October 2nd regarding this investigation? So what we did was we had reached back out to Valerie Kassler, um, as I mentioned earlier, and eventually heard back from her and Detective Baker, and I went and spoke with her again. Um, in addition to that, search warrants had been obtained for uh, Mr. Smith's phone records through AT&T, and I provided those records to Eric Perry uh, with the FBI cast team in order for him to be able to look into them and try to help us um, you know, with that data. So before we get into a little further about that, does, did Ms. Kassler provide you information in that second interview that led you to um, take some additional steps in locating some surveillance video? Yes, she did. And what was that? Uh, she had mentioned the, the Shell gas station. Um, so after speaking to Ms. Kassler, uh, Detective Baker and I went to the Shell station. And I contacted an employee and and gave him a, a approximate date range and times uh, for some video to, to assist us with. Um, at the time that we spoke to them, the person that that handled the video was not there. So I left it on a note for them to, to hear the dates and please call me for more information. So you said you obtained um, some cell phone, some search warrants for Mr. Smith's cell phone. Did that include in addition to his um, cell phone records, also what's re referred to as a ping warrant? Yes, in addition to the historical records, it uh, allowed us to basically receive a up-to-date location every 15 minutes of that phone, that phone number. And you received uh, uh, permission to ping Mr. Smith's phone on October 2nd? Yes, we did. And you provided that information to Special Agent Perry? Yes, we did. And why did you involve Special Agent Perry? Um, from working with him in the past, I know we know that he had a lot of connections in the, in the phone company business and um, could potentially help us get the warrant served quicker to, in order to start receiving that information uh, quicker than normally. Did ultimately uh, Special Agent Perry help you? Yes, he did. And did he provide um, location, the ping location about from Mr. Smith's phone on that particular date? Yes, he did. And it showed that he was in the area of the, in the Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. How does a ping warrant, to your knowledge, how does the ping warrant work? Or how often do you get a ping on someone's cell phone? Uh, the way they work, and, and we use the, ter the term live a lot, but really they're not live pings because by the time we received them, um, it's been, you know, five to 15 minutes past. So what that does is we'll receive a, a ping, a notification saying this phone, this phone number um, has hit off this tower within the last 15 minutes. They will give us coordinates for that tower that where we can, um, uh, via email, where we can plug those coordinates into a Google map, or we can give them to somebody like Eric Perry with the cast team. And um, they can tell us where that phone is at it, at that moment that they received the ping. So when um, Special Agent Perry told you that his phone was pinging um, in the lower 48 in the D.C. area, is was a decision made to involve other than law enforcement agencies to assist with your investigation? Yes, it was. And what agencies did you uh, ask to assist? Now, what we did is we researched the area where he was at and, and found out the local police department, the, I believe it was Fairfax Police Department or Fairfield, no, Fairfax. Um, in addition to them, we also uh, began working with, uh, we'd already worked with the FBI with Eric Perry, but also the FBI office um, in that area to assist us with um, locating and getting eyes on for surveillance, uh, Mr. Smith. In addition to them, um, Homeland Security and airport interdiction assisted us as well. So you also said you got historical data uh, through search warrant for Mr. Smith's phone. Did you provide that data as well to Mr. Perry on the 2nd of October? Yes, I did. And did he provide you, did he take that data and provide you some additional information about Mr. Smith's whereabouts? Yes, he did. And what was that information? Um, he told me that um, I gave him the uh, I gave him some of the locations and the dates that we were looking at, and he had called me and told me that um, one thing that was that was sticking out to him was a location where Mr. Smith was at at around 1:20 a.m. on September 6th, um, kind of outside of town, over at the Seward Highway and Rainbow Valley Road. Um, and he told me that phone was hitting off a tower in that area at that time. Was Mr. Smith aware? I'm sorry, was Sergeant Special Agent Perry aware at that time that a body had been located on that very day in that particular location? He had not. He was not aware of that that investigation going on at that time. 
Did it also, did he, uh, Special Agent Perry also give you information about his whereabouts uh, on the 4th of September? Yes, he said his phone was hitting in the area of the uh, town place uh, Marriott um, around that time. So based on the information that Special Agent Perry gave you on the 2nd of October, what were your thoughts about the investigation so far? At this point, um, it, it became more clear that Mr. Smith was, that we needed to obviously take a closer look into Mr. Smith and find out um, more about him. And then in addition to that, we needed to locate him in the Washington, D.C. area um, in order to get eyes on him and, and know about what his movements are at that time. At that time, we didn't know what what his purpose of being in that area was at the time. So. And um, do you recall when exactly eyes were actually put on Mr. Smith and surveillance began? I don't know the exact date. Um, I do know that Detectives Cordy and Lofman went there and met with those um, the, those agents there, but I believe that eyes had already been put on him by that time. So sometime between October 2nd and October 4th. Okay. So I want to move into October 3rd, um, the next day. Um, what did you do in regards to this investigation on the 3rd of October? Um, on the 3rd of October, you mind if I just refer to my report? Okay. <laughs> And if it helps, this is the day that they execute the search warrant on the Marriott. Okay, on October 3rd, I um, continuing on working with the investigation. I met with the crime scene team uh, leader, um, Lieutenant, now Lieutenant Fisher, um, who was going to be leading that team doing that search warrant. And I provided her with some of the images from the video, which included uh, the victim on the floor, uh, where she was at on the floor, and then an image of the luggage cart, um, specifically showing the sticker that made it kind of distinct. So, so they know where they're looking at in the room and which card they're looking for. Okay. Moving then on to the uh, around the uh, October fourth and fifth, um, did you receive or excuse me, Sergeant Cro well Captain Cross now Sergeant at the time had testified that she received some information of a possible identification of the female that was in the SD cards. Yes. Did she provide that information to you? Yes, she did. And what was the name that she provided to you? Uh, she provided to me Kathleen Jo Henry. In addition to providing a name, uh, did you were you able to obtain images of Kathleen Joe Henry? Uh, yes, I I looked at her uh, DMV photograph. And did you um, use those images while reviewing the videos to see if you could make a determination about whether or not you believed that might be Miss Henry in those images? Yes, I did. And what was your what what was your determination? Um, so what I did was I um. Just a moment. Oh, yes. Objections overruled. Effectively, based on your review of the images that you had of Kathleen Henry and your review of the um, images and the videos on the SD card, um, what did you notice? So, as I mentioned earlier, when I was watching the video, um, watched them several times and really paid attention to her face and noticed, you know, looking for, you know, marks, moles, um, anything that might make her uh, make them stand out on if you see another photo of her. Um, so what I did was I pulled the DMV photo, not only the most recent one, but um, some older, an older DMV photo of Kathleen Jill Henry. And what I noticed that in one of the videos, um, one of the last videos um, that you see Mr. Smith um, or the, the in the video, uh, pull her right eyelid, kind of open her eye and her eyelid opens up to where you can see a mole on that right eyelid. And I noticed that in the DMV photo that I looked at of Kathleen Jill Henry, she had a mole in that exact location on her right eye. Um, also, just looking at the photo of Kathleen Henry, I had looked at a lot of photos over the, the days during this, and just looking at her photo, I, I, I saw a resemblance um, in her face um, of, of the female victim in the video. And Judge, may I approach the witness? Yes. Effectively, um, for for the first exhibit that is there in front of you, it's exhibit number 331. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that? Uh, this is the DMV photo of uh, Kathleen Jill Henry, one of the DMV photos. And is that one of the photos that you um, reviewed when you were looking at in the video and also comparing DMV photos? Yes, it is. Okay. And Judge, at this time, I'd move to admit exhibit 331 and publish it to the jury. It's admitted. You may publish. Thank you. 
And in this particular photo, um, I don't know if you can see it in the photo. Is there any particular marks or distinguishing marks on um, Ms. Henry that you noticed that you used when you were reviewing the videos and images? Yes, the mole I was referring to on her right eye here is just right on the, you see right on the, uh, the crease of the eyelid uh, right there. Um, I mentioned the older photo, uh, but in this photo, you can see it in there as well, um, right there on the eyelid. You said you continued, um, and. Uh, Regarding Miss um, <clears throat> Henry, do you have any information uh, through your uh, records about her approximate weight and height? Yes, and in, in our ABD's Tiburon database, um, it had her um, at about five three and one hundred and seventy pounds. And what is that information based on? Uh, that's based on um, what's given at the DMV. So when we contact somebody and we run them and we write a police report and we transfer, basically we're transferring the data from DMV into our report and it auto fills height, weight, um, eye color, those sort of things. And based on um, your experience, is that information, is that, does the DMV verify height and weight? No, it, it's just something that people give. So it, it can be completely off or it can be accurate. Okay. I want to talk next about, as you continue to review images, um, as you said, you continue to watch these images a number of times, trying to make some identification of things. Um, did you make a, a further discovery regarding the images as you continue to review them about the truck? Yeah. So initially when I reviewed the videos myself, then I, I watched them on my, my small little computer, uh, computer monitor. But when we, um, reviewed them on our larger television in our briefing room we were able to i was able to notice that in one of the images you could actually see a partial um couple numbers in the license plate well is that because you were able to manipulate the photo and 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 uh, sort of blow it up yes okay you can zoom in on it on the program manager. looking at exhibit uh 332 sorry 316 sorry these are a lot of order do you recognize that photo? Uh, 317 or 316? Sorry. 317. 317. Yes, I do recognize it. And what is that an image of? Uh, this is that photo uh, zoomed in looking at the license plate on the back of the pickup truck with the tailgate open. Okay. And what are the numbers you can see on there? Uh, eight, seven. And does that correspond mm -hmm. to part of the license plate for Mr. Smith's truck? Yes, it does. This time, Jojo would move to admit exhibit 317 and publish the jury. Objection. Admitted, you may publish. And can you show us uh, what we're looking at in this particular photo? Yeah, so the this is the tailgate open. Um, when you back out, this is uh, the luggage rack rails. This is the bumper of the truck, and this is the license plate kind of illuminated by the light. And then you can see the eight and the seven, and you can get a partial of the third uh, digit as well, but you can't be certain numbers in this photo. And is that actually a blown up of previously admitted states 29 EE? Yes, it is. Okay. So um, after Sergeant Cross gave you the name um, of the potential ID and you looked at the DMV photos um, and, and did your own um, kind of review of things, did you actually receive information um, on the 4th or the 5th regarding a positive ID by the medical examiner's office? Yes, I was told that uh, the, the, the body that had been found at mile 108 <laughs> was identified at, as Kathleen Jill Henry. So at that point in time, uh, what happened with that investigation, the mile 108 investigation? Uh, they were merged together and it became part of um, the, the investigation that I was working. When um, those remains were determined to be um, Ms. Henry's, how does the department go about making next of kin notification? Um, so there's a couple ways. Um, the easy thing is when they're local, we can look people up and find them locally and, and we go and we talk to them and let them know, make the notification in person. Um, sometimes um, when we look up people's next of kin, we find that they're outside of Anchorage or even outside of Alaska. Um, so what we do as a department is we have our dispatch reach out to the dispatch of the local police department, wherever that might be in Alaska, it could be troopers or um, village police officers or, or a different department. And we uh, give them the details of our investigation and we ask them to go make contact with the family to notify them. 
And uh, was that done in this particular case? Yes, it was. Okay. And who was involved? Uh, which law enforcement agency was involved in helping notify Next of Ken? I believe it was ASD Anchorage, uh, excuse me, Alaska State Troopers. And do you uh, you recall where the family of Miss Henry was located? Yes, that was in Eek, Alaska. And um, <clears throat> do you recall um, if contact was ultimately made with her family there in Eek? Yes, it was. Were you provided information? Um, let me rephrase that. So did you do your own research about Ms. Henry once you had made an identification about who who your victim was in this case? Yeah, once we confirmed that, I, I began doing the same thing, looking, up, looking into her within our databases and our systems, police reports, contacts, that sort of thing. What kind of information did you discern about Ms. Henry? Um, when I could tell, she did have quite a bit of police contact. I went back as far as probably 2016. Um, a lot of alcohol related calls, uh, mental mental issues. Um, seems like she struggled with those things and, and had a lot of police contact. Um, um, a lot of a few of them in the area of uh, Fairview, 13th Avenue, Cars area there. And that's all based on your records in Anchorage, correct? Yes. Okay. So it looks like, would it be fair to say she'd been in Anchorage probably since 2016? Yes, or, or before. I, that's just as about as far back as, our, as I went in our system. And to your knowledge, did... Um, did Ms. Henry have contact um, with her family in Eek? Um, what I was told is that she had not been in contact with them for many years. Did um, Have you received any one from her family reaching out to you after she was identified? I, ne I never did, no. Okay. Um, do you frequently have contact from family members after uh, an, a victim has been identified in a homicide as you work cases? Destruction of relevance. What's the relevance? We're, we're talking, Judge, this is a vulnerable victim, and we're trying to, I'm trying to establish the information that Detective Lee knows about that, this particular victim, well, and what I'm, is normal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sustain the objection. You can ask other questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> around the fourth or fifth, or what was the day that uh, Sergeant Cross decided to send Detective Wolfman and Detective Cordy to D.C.? I believe it was on the fifth or sixth. And then um, <clears throat> so as the lead detective, um, you work with your, do you work with your sergeant to make decisions about who's going to do what role? Or does the sergeant do some of those things as well? Uh, no, as the lead detective, you, you have some say on um, your thoughts on what, what you think should happen. And what was that? Why was the decision to send Detective Lee and Detective, I'm sorry, Detective Cordy and Detective Wolfman to DC? What was that decision made based on and why? The decision was made is because ultimately, um, Regardless of whether or not Mr. Smith got onto his plane back to Anchorage or if he stayed in that area, um, we wanted two detectives there to be able to conduct interviews. And like I said, regardless of him, if he came back, we still wanted uh, Ms. Bislin to be contacted and interviewed. Um, and then if for whatever reason he did not get back on the plane to come back to Anchorage, then we would have detect detectives there to interview Mr. Smith. Did you have information that he actually was due to be coming back to Anchorage? Yes, we had learned from uh, Homeland Security that he did have a flight back to Anchorage on the 8th. And do you recall about when you uh, became aware of that information? Uh, sometime, uh, I believe, on the 6th or 7th. Um, so let's talk then about um, the October 8th, when Mr. Smith uh, came back to Anchorage. Did uh, you prepare to interview Mr. Smith if he um, agreed to speak with you? Yes, I did. And can, let's talk a little bit about that. What kind of preparation did you um, do in, for this particular interview? Um, so I spent uh, a few days um, kind of just starting at the beginning. So I went back to the 2018 case um, and reviewed all the police reports and any, any um, evidence that might have been submitted into that case. Um, I continued with reviewing the videos um, that we had obtained here in the images and um, and then looking into Mr. Smith's as far as social media um, and any prior police contacts. In addition to that, we also um, detectives Lofman and Cordy, while they were down in Virginia, had contact with the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. And I, I did end up get, having a kind of a conference call, phone call with them after what they had learned about Mr. Smith um, through their um, contact with the detectives there. Um, kind of gave just kind of we discussed the interview and 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 you know things to do things not to do during the interview. Before we get to uh, a little bit about the interview earlier in that day, was there um, a plan a briefing uh, 
regarding the service of search warrants. Uh, yes. And um, can you describe that briefing? So in this, it was a pretty large briefing. We held it at the, the Anchorage Police uh, Elmore Station, and um, it included um, not only the APD homicide unit, but Anchorage Police Department um, computer crimes, um, CAP team, which is the community action policing team, um, Homeland Security, FBI, and airport interdiction, as well as the um, Alaska State Troopers. What was the purpose of the briefing exactly? The purpose of the briefing is we wanted we wanted things to happen almost simultaneously to prevent um, if if word got out that we were there or if if, if Mr. Smith had learned that this was going on, we wanted to pre prevent the officer destruction of evidence. And so the briefing was so that make sure everybody understands their role in in the operation and to make sure that things go over. Uh, the way we wanted them to. We wanted, um, as we were contacting Mr. Smith, we wanted Ms. Bisslin contacted at the same time to prevent any contact there. And we also wanted to make sure that um, the residence was secured, the pickup truck was secured, and then um, we wanted officers at the Spring Hill Suites um, basically holding onto that location until the detectives could get there to, to start the search there. So uh, were some of the officers then, their sole purpose was to go to the particular places where you're going to execute search warrants and remain there and secure it until detectives or crime scene could eventually respond to that location and execute the search warrant? Yes. So um, at some point, did you go to the airport that afternoon yes, in anticipation of meeting Mr. Smith? Yes, I did. Do you recall about what time you went to the airport? Uh, roughly about 1, 1 30 p.m. that day. And who do you um, meet at the airport or interact with the airport in preparation of meeting Mr. Smith? Um, we, we met with Sergeant Chafin um, so that he could take us back into the kind of their area, the security area back there, so we could prepare for the interview. So I want to talk uh, a little bit about the interview. Um, has As a detective, have you received training in interview techniques? Yes, I have. And what are some of the techniques that you learn as a detective to use in interviews? Um, I've attended many uh, interview trainings, including read um, interrogations and interviews, um, ITV um, and cognitive interviewing classes. And what I kind of what I've done over the years is I don't particularly use one method. I kind of built my own um, method of interviewing. And I say interviewing. We've heard inter interrogation a lot, but I like to treat it more as an interview. Um, I don't like to do all the talking, which is what you normally hear in interrogation. I want to hear what the other person has to say. Um, I, I try to I try to treat all my interviews the same. I'm going to come into it um, with having a clean slate with the person. I want to hear what they what you know what they know what they can tell me about what we're investigating. And how would you describe um, your style of interview with Mr. Smith? Um, like I said, um, I would say it was very. Uh, I feel like I was very. Professional, respectful. Um, I've learned. I learned a long time in my career, a long time ago, that if you if you start out uh, uh, contact with a person, treating them respectfully and treating them like a person, and and genuinely hearing what they want to say, you're going to have more success in those interviews. And that's how I, I feel like I started this interview was making contact with them, um, letting them know who we are and that we wanted to talk to them, um, and then basically opening the floor to him to find out what he knows about what we want to talk about. And um, we heard from Detective Bell, but during the interview, um, was additional information being provided to you and or Detective Bell as the interview was ongoing? Yes, the interview was being viewed um, video uh, recording in another room, and we were receiving information as we were interviewing from those folks in that room that were looking through uh, Mr. Smith's devices and that sort of thing. During your interview, I uh, actually, let me rephrase, at the end of your interview, Mr. Smith agreed to take you to the location where he said he dumped Ms. Abuchuk's body. Is that correct? Yes, he did. Okay. And um, just in general, can you remind us what the particular area of, um, of that was in the state? Yeah. So if you were going outbound the Glen, past, um, all the way past uh, Eklutna, and you get to the exit, the old Glen exit, you get off on the old Glen exit that veers off to the right and follow that um, around until you come to the, the old uh, including the power plant. And, um, and, and while this was happening, he showed us how to get there. Um, past the power plant on the left-hand side of the road, there was a, there's a rail. And as he described, it was at the end of that guardrail. There's a little bit of a pull-off, um, kind of a dirt pull-off that kind of wise into a Y. And that's where we went. 
So this is st previous admitted state exhibit eight behind you. I don't know if, are you able to see about the area on that map and pointed out where uh, Mr. Smith showed you he dumped the body? Yeah, so this is the, the power plant I was talking about. And so if you continue along here, a guardrail, you can't really see it in this image, um, but it goes along the road here. And at the end of that guardrail, there is a turnoff um, just right at the end of it, almost, you almost have to go back around the guardrail to get to it and then to this area. So it sort of looks like a road, kind of, but it's not really a road. Is that what you said? It looks like if you, as you pass by it, it looks to me more like you would see like a full wheeling trail or a hiking trail starting off the road there is what it looks like. Um, <clears throat> I want to then move on to um, the next day after um, uh, the 9th of October. Were some of the search warrants actually executed on the 9th of October? Yeah, so the, the Ford Ranger pickup truck, we had actually impacted or towed it to our secured area where we, with the crime scene team, would per per do the search on it. After the search of um, the truck, did Detective Straley provide you information about what was located in that truck? Yes, he did. And what was some of that information he provided you? Uh, he, he called me and told me that there was some receipts that he had found. Um, uh, specifically, he told me about a McDonald's receipt, um, a couple Walmart receipts, and a holiday gas station receipt. So I'm showing you what's been marked as previous exhibit admitted 241. What are those? Uh, these are the Walmart receipts, um, uh, Walmart receipts he told me about um, that he found in the pickup truck during the search. And what are those receipts for? Uh, starting with this one over here, um, Walmart, A Street. Um, this is the one that's kind of faded out, but it, it, as it's blown up and closer, you can see what appears to be the word phone and then a number right there and then a, a series of others up here including product serial number right and then right under serial number there's a number um a price uh total of 42 dollars and 87 cents and then a date of september 3rd 2019 at uh, 9 18 p.m and then how about the receipt on the right? One on the right, the same uh, location, um, same date, 9 3 19, only this one is about seven minutes later at 9 25 p.m. And this one is for uh, steel reserve uh, beer, some sort of alcohol beer. With this information, what did you um, what did you do? Um, I went to uh, the Walmart A Street and I contacted uh, loss prevention with this information, and they um, took my, my request and eventually gave me video from from uh, from the purchase of the seal reserve is what they had video of. Okay, I want to show you then what's been also previously admitted as exhibit exhibit two forty four. What what is that? This is the McDonald's receipt I talked about. Um, and I, same thing, I look at it for the location, which is 800 West Northern Lights, um, over at the Arctic and Northern Lights uh, date, which is September 6, 2019 at 1.59 a.m. Uh, two Big Macs were bought and a uh, total of $7.10 paid with uh, paid cash, looks like. Or, yeah, can't really tell how they paid, but yeah. So based on um, the information from this receipt that uh, Detective Straley provided you, what did you do? I called, uh, on this one, I called the McDonald's and spoke to a manager, and uh, he informed me he would be able to assist with video. And then ultimately, I went to the McDonald's and received video uh, from this transaction. How many videos did you receive? Um, uh, from McDonald's, two video, two video clips. And um, have you uh, reviewed those? Did you review those videos? Yes, I did. And what do those videos show? The video is from, I believe it's, I don't, it's one of the drive-through windows. It's a video looking, um, looking out from the drive-through, a very clear video. And what you see is, uh, the, the black Ford Ranger. You can see the license plate clearly in the video pull up and you can see Mr. Smith in the driver's seat, uh, wearing a bright red shirt and then a female, um, sitting in the passenger seat with kind of a blue knit cap on. Um, that's what you see in the front of the truck. Did you recognize the female? Uh, I did not recognize her, but I what I did was what I did a lot a lot of times in cases is I took some screenshots of her and sent her around to see if anybody could help me identify her. Was were you given a possible name as who that female might be? Yes, I was. And were you able to ever locate that female? Uh, no, I was not. Okay. At this time, Judge, I would move to admit seat exhibit three one eight and three one nine, which are the McDonald's videos. They're admitted. So this is exhibit 318. 
Next will be exhibit 319. There we go. Has this video um or the video didn't play the whole way, so let me just pull it up and not in PowerPoint so it's played accurately. So Detective Lee, um, when you watched that video, did you um, make any other observations um, about um, Mr. Smith or the truck? Yes, I did. And what were those observations? Um, at the end of the video, at, when the video ends actually is right when it stops on that uh, rear uh, window of the copper on the back of the truck. And what I could see in there was um, appeared to be a white uh, blanket and a blue tarp, um, which was consistent with the white blanket and the blue tarp that I saw in the images uh, that we were provided by Ms. Casper. And um, if you look at state's exhibit um, three, I believe it's 320, 320. Mm -hmm. And what is that? Uh, this is a still shot of that, uh, the back of the truck okay. from the video. At this time, I would move to admit state's exhibit 320. Okay. Ms. Yes. Um, What are we looking at in 320? Uh, so this is that, what I was telling you about what I could see in the back of the truck. Um, there is a reflection, so you have to kind of decide what's not in the back of the truck. But right here, you can see the white, um, what appears to be white um, uh, blanket, and then also um, uh, looks like the blue tarp in the back of the truck. And then of course, the reflection of the worker and shelving down. But those are the two items I know this street. If you look in front of you, there's exhibit 321. And do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that? This, uh, the image on the on the left is the um, white blanket um, in the back of the pickup truck from the images provided by Ms. Kassler uh, with the body of uh, Kathleen. And then the image on the right? Uh, this is the pickup truck uh, image with the white blanket in the back of the truck. Okay. At this time, Judge, I'd move to admit Exhibit 321 and publish. Uh, okay. Admit, admit, publish. So what are we looking at on the left of Exhibit 321? So I apologize. I couldn't see it on mine. It's a little darker. But as you see it on the big screen, you can see much better the blue, uh, shiny 
appears to be the tarp and then the, the white blanket has the that seems to have the kind of the feel the pattern of the blanket uh, appears that appears in the video on the bed and also in the back of the truck um, and then this is the image of the truck with that blanket and uh, the tarp there time frame was taken um from the McDonald's video at nine on nine six two thousand nineteen at approximately two a.m. Is that accurate? Yes, it was. And would this be before or after cell phone records show Mr. Smith's cell phone um, out at mile one hundred eight point five of the Seward Highway? This would be after that. I want to talk to you. You said you had uh, contacted Walmart um, to obtain video of Mr. Smith based on the timeframes of the purchases on the receipts, correct? Yes, I did. Did ultimately Walmart provide you video? Yes, I did. Okay. And did you review that video? Yes, I did. What does that video show? Uh, the video shows um, Mr. Smith. The first video you see him is um, outside of the liquor store uh, in the Walmart. And uh, he's walking down the aisle and uh, turns and goes into the liquor store, has uh, something in his hand that you can see a little bit clearer later on in, in a, another video. And did you receive a series of videos that sort of have him at different points in the store? Yes, there's different angles. There's that one outside of the liquor store. There's some inside the liquor store looking down the alley with the or aisle, excuse me, with the um, refrigerators. And then there's a register camera. So the next exhibit would be three. 322, I believe 322, which. Um, is the Walmart video? Have you? It, it's um, sort of comp. It's a compilation of videos put together for purposes of trial. Did you review those videos? Yes, I did. And are those a fair and accurate representation of the videos you received from Walmart? Yes, they are. At this time, Judge, I would move to um, play Exhibit three two three twenty two. No objection. Okay. And if you just give me one minute, and you may play. Okay. Thank you, Judge. It's not in the PowerPoint, so I just need to switch over to. Yes. We probably should get to a point where we take a break in the not too distant okay. future. Okay. We'll play this judge and then we'll uh, take a break. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's okay. So this is the liquor store right here, and then this is Mr. Smith walking down the alley here. And this video was based that they gave you was based on the time frames you provided them based on the receipts, correct? Yes. Sir. And what was the time frame of the day? The uh, date time. Uh, about nine uh, between nine eighteen and nine twenty five uh, p.m. on on the, on the fourth. Okay. And I misspoke. It was actually on the third.
Did you want to take a break now, Judge? Yes. Okay. Take 15 minutes, folks. <laughs> Juries in the courtroom, are there matters we need to take up, counsel? No, judge. No, nothing from the state judge. Take our break. Please be seated, everyone. We've got our jury back with us. It's quarter to 11. Everyone else is here that needs to be here in order to resume the trial. And you may continue your questionings of the de detective. Thank you, Judge. Uh, detective Lee, when we uh, took a break, we had just finished watching the video from Walmart, State's Exhibit 322. In front of you is Exhibit State's Exhibits 323 and 324. Can you take a look at those? Yes. And do you recognize what those? Yes, I do. And what are those? These are screenshots of that video we just watched at the Walmart liquor store register area camera. Okay. This time I'd move to admit exhibits 323 and 324. No objection. They're admitted. And I'd like to publish to the jury, please. Yes, you may. So. Judge, may we approach? Yes. Sorry, I forgot where we were, so let me start over. Have you, uh, let's look at exhibits 323 and 2324. I think you, uh, we've admitted them, they're pu being published, correct? I think that's where we are, Judge? They are. Okay, so exhibit 323 is behind you, Detective Lee. Can you describe what we're looking at in 323? Yeah, this is a still shot from the register camera in the Walmart liquor store on the evening of the 3rd of September, 2019, at about 9.20, 9 9.25 p.m. Uh, this is Mr. Smith right here, and this is you know, holding the cans of beer. And then in this hand, he's holding um, what I recognize to be a box for a track phone, uh, what appeared to be the receipt for it uh, over uh, it with his uh, left hand. So I'm showing you next, but uh, you previously talked about Exhibit 241. There was a serial number, I believe, you uh, indicated on the receipt on the left. Yes, this number right here. And then I'm going to show you what's been marked previously and admitted as Exhibit 242. Do you see a picture of that serial number here in any of these photos? Uh, yes, on the what appears to be a track phone uh, user guide, uh, the serial number is listed right here on the top of the And remind the jury what these photos were from? Uh, these were from the pickup truck uh, during the search warrant of the pickup truck, the Ford Ranger pickup truck. 
And then um, exhibit number 324, what are we looking at in this particular photo? This is another still screenshot from that uh, liquor store camera um, with Mr. Smith here, the beers here, and now he's holding what appears to be another cell phone, uh, cell phone type wallet uh, in his hand. In that image. So I want to talk to you about, you said uh, there were holiday gas stations, there was a holiday gas station um, receipt that Detective Straley brought to your attention. Did you obtain, uh, do you recall the date of that receipt? Uh, I'd have to refer to my report for that. Okay. Might be in your ARS 31. Date on that receipt was um, September 6th, excuse me, September 5th, 2019, at about 11.04 a.m. Do you recall which uh, which holiday gas station it was? Yeah, so the one on East Tudor Road. And did you obtain video from the holiday gas station? Yes, I did. Did uh, did you watch that video? Yes, I did. And could you describe what you see in that video? Um, in the video, you can see the, the pickup truck pull up to a gas pump, uh, very out of out of focus and out of view of the camera. You can see it, but just not close enough to see detail of what's inside the truck. Um, you do see Mr. Smith come into the store and uh, make a purchase, um, but that's it. Okay. I want to move on then to um, the 16th of October. Um, were you notified by the Department of Corrections that they had um, some information for you regarding this particular case? Yes, I was. And what um, what was the information you were provided? Uh, the sergeant from the anger to your say. Repeat the question. What was the information DOC provided him? It's state of mind as to why he did what he's about to describe what he did. And that's for a limiting instruction. Uh, the, uh, the evidence that is being requested is admissible only for the purpose of this explaining why the detective did what he did next. It's not admissible for the purpose of proving, assuming that it's a statement that will come in, whatever the statement says happened, it's not admissible for that purpose. Admissible to prove why he did what he did next. Okay. And uh, Detective Lee, what did they, uh, what was the purpose of their contact with you? Uh, they were letting me know that while they were going through Mr. Smith's property, they found um, what they believed to be an SD card inside of, uh, kind of tucked inside of a pocket in his wallet. What did you do then? Um, at that point, I prepared a search warrant to go and seize that uh, SD card and to look onto it to see what's on there. Did you, in fact, obtain the search warrant and the card? Yes, I did. And did you have, did you yourself look or have the uh, cyber crimes text look, look at that particular SD card? I submitted it to cyber crimes text. And did they look at anything of value for this particular investigation? No, they did not. Um, I also want to talk to you uh, on that same day. Did uh, Crime Tech Hunter provide you um, some additional information he had located um, after reviewing all of the digital devices that were seized from Mr. Smith's residence? Yes, he did. And what did he provide you? He provided me disks from um, digital data that he had um, obtained from several of the uh, the USB drives and the and the drives taken from Mr. Smith's residence, including the a, a blue and silver USB. And was that tag number one one seven two zero four five, and then sublabeled number B because there were a number of actual items in that one particular tag? Yes. And is that the the um, SD or excuse me the uh, jump drive that we have previously been referencing in this trial? Yes, it is. And what was what was on that particular? Um, disc regarding the evidence the detective or the crime scene tech hunter provided to you uh there were videos um that appeared to be inside the basement based on what we'd seen with crime scene photographs in the basement of mr smith um you actually see mr smith's face in the video uh, a couple of the videos and then in the videos there appears to be a female on some of the videos lying on the couch um uh, the red couch and then also on the floor of the, of the basement there Based on your investigation, did you have a belief as to you believe, who you believed was in those videos? Yes, based on my interview with Mr. Smith and then also comparing photographs of Veronica Abochuk, uh, I identified the female on the couch as Veronica. How many videos in total did you receive from detect or crime scene tech hunter? I believe it was seven. I'm not exactly sure. Okay. I don't recall. 
And um, have you reviewed those videos in preparation for trial? Yes, I did. And are those a fair and accurate representation of the videos that you, you provided to you early on in this investigation? Yes, they are. And those have been labeled Exhibit 325, um, sublabeled Exhibits A through G. The state would move at this time to play those exhibits. Okay. And Judge, I'm going to ask... And you may play them, but we, we need to make some changes. I'm just going to ask Detective Hunter um, to, sorry, Detective Lee, I keep making crime scene tech Hunter detective. Detective Lee, I'm going to ask Detective Lee to put up a block to the live screen for the first few videos, and then we can take it down. Okay, and that, that means also to the folks filming that the order I entered earlier kicks in at this point. And I would move then to publish these videos. And actually, just may we approach a quick second? Yes, you may. Yeah, sorry. Objections are overruled. You may proceed. Had you had you moved for admissibility? For I admission? did, Judge, and I um, I did move to admit them. I believe Mr. Air did not have an objection, and now I uh, re request to publish them. They're admitted, and you may publish. If you give me one moment, I do need to switch over from the PowerPoint. And that was video A? Yes. Okay, we'll play 325B. Three twenty five C. Video 325D. Video 325B. Video 325F. And Detective Lee, as we're watching this, were some of the videos that you provided slightly distorted? Yes, they had appeared to have some sort of issues with the, a couple of the videos. Yes. And then video 325G. <laughs> and so we can uh, take down the screen. Uh, Detective Lee, when um, Detective Hunter, when Tech Hunter provided you these videos, did he provide you information about um, the location of these videos? Uh, yes, he did. And did he provide you any information about how he was able to recover those videos? Oh, yes, he did. And what was that information? Um, basically, that they had been deleted, um, but he was able to recover them from the USB, the blue and silver USB. And would that explain some of the distortion in some of those videos? Yes. One moment. We're actually going to still use the... Sorry, still use the screen. Give me one second. Let's go ahead and back up weekend. Detective Hunter, uh, or Detective Lee, sorry. Jeez. Um, I'm showing you what's been marked as, um, sorry. on exhibits in front of you, Mark, exhibits, uh, 326, 327, and 
Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And what are those? Uh, these are uh, 326 is a series of um, still shots on the left from the videos and um, on the right um, crime scene photographs that were taken by our crime scene team during the search of the residence. 327 is, uh, is the same a still shot from the video on the left and a still or an image taken by crime scene on the right. And 328 is a still shot of the video. One photo. Are those um, are those fair and accurate uh, representations of the videos, screenshots of the videos um, versus screenshots from the crime scene team? Yes, they are. At this time, Judge, I would move to admit exhibits 326, 327, and 328 and publish to the jury. I just moved to admit them. I was. Is there objection? Uh, nothing further than I already stated, Judge. Okay. Objections overruled. They're admitted and you may publish. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at exhibit 326. Can you describe what that is? Oh, uh, yeah. 326 is uh, what I was talking about. That is um, on the left are screenshots. Uh, from the videos and on the right are images from the crime scene photographs. In the top one, um, you'll see Mr. Smith's uh, face, head, upper body, shoulders. And then in the background, you can see the white uh, entertainment center with a television, um, a photograph of what appears to be a military soldier and a flag on the left, and then the propeller uh, matching what we saw during the search of the residence. And how about the two images on the bottom? Um, this is a screenshot from the image uh, showing uh, Veronica on the couch, and you can see the red couch, you can see a blanket on the floor, um, and then a chair in the background, and a table kind of on the corner there. And on the crime scene, you can see everything uh, matches with the red couch, the chair in the back. So we're going to move on to exhibit 327. 327 on the left again is a still shot uh, from the video. Um, you can see on the television the, what you heard from Mr. Hunter with the television with uh, Trump on there. Um, you can see some alcohol bottle on the table, and this is uh, Veronica's leg here. Um, at the base of the entertainment center, you can see um, a handgun stuck into um, what appears to be the oil filter um, silencer on the floor. and um, and of course, the chair and the propeller in the background. And then on the right is a crime scene photograph of that silencer in the garage taken by crime scene. So 328. And 328 is just one full image screenshot from the video showing um, uh, Veronica on the floor there, a uh, towel over her head um, with what appears to be blood on it, and um, the gun and the silencer and the, the chest with the uh, bottles. In your interview with Mr. Smith, did he discuss when um, he brought Ms. Abuchek back to the residence that she had had some alcohol on her? Uh, yes, he did. Do you recall what kind of alcohol he said she had on her? I, I believe it was some sort of whiskey. Okay. Um, so 328 mm -hmm. is a screenshot you said from the video. And then looking at previously admitted 187, what are we looking at in this photo compared to that last photo? Uh, comparatively, this is the crime scene photograph that was taken by our crime scene team after they had moved the couch back. You can see the couch was on sliders, and so you can see where it had been um, based on the markings on the floor. And then you can see the circles drawn by crime scene to show uh, where they had um, further investigation of the carpet um, with the placards one, two, and three. And this is also then previously admitted crime for 216. Can you describe again what we're looking at in this photo in relation to the video? Yes, another angle of the, the downstairs area there with the red couch backed up and the carpet has now been cut and rolled up. And you can see, had the couch been moved back where it was, it would be consistent where Veronica was lying on the floor and of course the blood, blood stain on the floor. I'm going to move then on to... Um, the 18th of October. Actually, I'm, I apologize. Let me go back one. 
There um, is a, in the videos, in the images in the videos, there is a holiday or a blanket with the three distinguishable. Is that a blanket that uh, you ended up teasing from the residents? Yes, it is. I had pointed it out earlier, but it was the brown blanket uh, that you can see in the video. And uh, ultimately, I went back and contacted Ms. Bislin about that blanket and she had provided it. And is that the same blanket that we heard Ms. Gregor talk about testing yesterday? Yes, it is. Okay. I want to move on to the 18th of October um, and your continued investigation in this case. Um, what had you, as you were continuing to investigate this case, what other things are you doing um, for the investigation? Um, part of it is that the phone was had been uh, seized and searched to be a search warrant. And so what, what that means is that it was submitted to our um, computer crimes techs and they performed what's called a forensic download of that phone and then provided uh, me with a report of that which so that I can go for, go through and read um, text messages, look through images, phone calls, call logs, anything you can find on a cell phone, you'll find on that report. So does that include um, any, not, not only text messages from your normal phone, like I have an, an Apple, it's got the iMessage or whatever, but also any messages, any apps used to message back and forth? Yeah, so for example, on an iPhone, you'll see iMessage, um, you'll see MMS, SMS, and then if you have apps such as Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Tinder, and all of those, sometimes those will be pulled in that forensic download and you'll see them on the report as well. So when you were, were you reviewing Mr. Smith's cell phone records on the 18th of October? Yes, I was. And did you, um, in reviewing those, come in, find messages that you believe were pertinent to this investigation? Yes, I did. Can you describe what those messages were? So what I did is I went to the time specifically I was looking for, which would have been around September 4th, September 3rd, just to see who, who he was contacting, who the phone was contacting at that time. And I found um, conversations with a phone, uh, phone number 907-390-7035. And it was listed in his phone under contact with Ian Calhoun. And what was uh, in general the, the, the nature of the the messages I object to your state judge can we approach yes objection overruled you may proceed so detectively did you find mess text messages between um mr smith and an ian calhoun around the time frame of the homicide Yes, I did. Of Miss Henry. Yes, I did. And um, I'm sure in, in front of you was exhibits 308, 309, and 310 and 11. Do you recognize those? Yes, I do. And what are those? These are screenshots of that report I was talking about. Um, it comes in a PDF form, and this is the section that shows you the text messages on the phone. And when you're reading these messages, do they actually um, print off in chronological order or is there um, a variety of ways that they might present themselves in written form like this in the report? In this form, they start out when you're looking down the report, it starts out most recent to farthest back. So as you're reading, starting at the top, you're reading the most recent messages. And then so if you want to read a, a chronological conversation, you go to the bottom and read your way back up. And when did these messages occur with between Mr. Calhoun and Mr. Smith? Uh, the first one I noticed um, for this particular day was on September 4th, 2019 at 1254 a.m. And that would have been around the same time as the images were created on the SD card? Yes, it is. Okay. At this time, and Judge, uh, Mr. Or Detective Lee, 308 through 311, are those a fair and accurate representation of the text messages as you reviewed them in the records received from AT&T? Yes, it is. At this time, I'd move to admit 308 to 311 and publish to the jury. Over, they're admitted over objection. You may publish. So the first, uh, first is 308, and there are some highlighted portions um, on that screen. Can you read who those messages are from and to and the dates and times, please? Uh, yes, starting with two is to 907-390-7035, and then under it is Calhoun Ian, and the time of 9-4-2019 at 12.54 a.m., it says it was sent, and um, the message is, hey, H-E-H, -E period, you, up, 
period. I'm having fun. And then does Mr. Calhoun uh, respond later? Yeah, he re responds about seven hours later. Um, and it says now from 907-309-0735, Calhoun Ian, um, at about 7.08 a.m. on the 4th of uh, September. And he responds, I was not up, comma, sounds like you were having a lot of fun. And does the conversation continue then onto the next page? Yes, it does. Okay, so page 309. So a couple hours later, uh, Mr. Smith sends a text message to Ian Calhoun to the same phone number, uh, 9.16 a.m., uh, 9.4.2019, that says hi. And then at 9.17, Ian Calhoun responds with, uh, excuse me, Mr. Smith sends another message to Mr. Calhoun saying, I did have fun, wanted to share. And so you're reading these from the bottom to the top, correct? Yes, I am. Okay. Bottom to the top. And did uh, Mr. Calhoun respond? He did at uh, basically seconds later, 9.17 a.m. Um, and he stated, we need to get together for a drink soon. And did the text continue between Mr. Calhoun and Mr. Smith? They do. Um, Mr. Calhoun says, what? Question mark. I'm in Anchorage. Yes. And then Mr. Smith sends a text at 917 also. So basically within seconds of each other saying, are you anywhere near me today? He spelled today wrong with an S where the A should be, uh, but it appears to be today. And then uh, Calhoun responds with, but I'll be working until four-ish. Is it possible that the way these print, the text could have gone, are you anywhere near me today? And then he responded, what? I'm in Anchorage, yes, but I'll be working until four-ish? Yes. Okay. And then at the top, the top line, uh, what is that text message? Uh, the top line is uh, to Ian Calhoun at 9.20 a.m. And he says, uh, this is from Smith's phone, I have something to show you, period, something I can't keep for too long. Moving on then to Exhibit 310, do the messages continue? Yes, they do. So starting from the bottom again, um, to Ian Calhoun at 1536, which is 336 p.m., uh, Mr. Smith says, I will be fine fishing at 430. Need to find a secluded spot to meet. And I think uh, based on the conversation, I believe he meant to say finishing, but he wrote fishing. Is that the next message where he's clarifying then? Oh, he does. Yes. at. Uh, 1537. So about a minute later, he uh, sends another text to Ian Calhoun. I will be finishing at 430. And then Mr. Does Mr. Calhoun respond to that? He does. He says, okay, I should be off pretty close to them. So then moving on to exhibit 311. So, starting from the bottom, correct? Yeah, starting from the bottom and at about 446 p.m. on 9-4 to Ian Calhoun. Uh, Smith again, hey, at H -A H E H period, I'm at a small park close to your home, period, you finish work yet. Then he sends another, um, appears to be an address uh, to Ian Calhoun, it says Forsyth Park, Forsyth Park, 11301 Birch Road, Anchorage, Alaska, 99516, uh, there is a phone number, I believe it was a Parks Rec number, and then a, uh, it says maps, that's why I believe he set a map location. And, and then, then the, I'm sorry, go no, ahead. No worries. And then Calhoun responds at 1653, 453 p.m. saying, give me one minute. Well, we saw previously Special Agent uh, Perry had mapped out uh, Mr. Smith's and Mr. Calhoun's um, cell phone locations. Um, did we see that Mr. Smith did actually respond to that park at Forsyth Park? Yes, he did. Okay. I want to uh, talk to you then. Did you, in addition to finding these particular text messages, were there any other types of messaging between Mr. Smith and Mr. Calhoun of note? Yes, I did find uh, Facebook Messenger messages between Mr. Calhoun and, and Brian Smith. And when did these? When did those occur? Uh, the ones I was reading started around October second of twenty nineteen. Objection, Judge. Same objections before. Different set of messages. Yeah, I, I understand the objection. What's the? Next They're question? from the same records, Judge. Do you do you have a question pending? I was about to. I'm going to read some of those. I mean, I'm going to admit some of them, move to admit some of those messages. Yes. Okay. You haven't done so yet. Yes, correct. The objection is overruled. You may, they're admitted and you may publish. Yeah. Those are exhibits 312 through 316. And do you recognize those? 
Yes, I do. And what are those? Uh, these are the Facebook messages I found on uh, Brian Smith's phone between uh, Brian Smith's Facebook and Ian Calhoun's Facebook. And um, at this time, I'd move to, I will publish 312, which is, okay, this exhibit. What are we looking at here in exhibit 312? Uh, so it looks like a very large message, but uh, it appeared to be that he was sending a uh, link and the images, um, once you clicked on the link, in the, this is a message bubble, and I don't know why it's sent so many times, but when you clicked on it, this is what popped up was a KTU uh, news article about human remains found on the Seward Highway near Beluga Point. Um, and it has part of the story with some images from the scene out of mile 108. And who was sending who was sending these messages to who? So in these ones, the, the blue would be sent from Ian Calhoun and the green would be sent from Brian Smith. So blue is Ian. Green is Brian Smith. And what was the date and time these were this message started? Uh, on October 2nd, 2019 at 1255 p.m. So you said green is Mr. Smith responding? Yes. Okay. And what does Mr. Smith say? So at uh, 1257 p.m. on uh, the same day, 10 to 2019, he responds with oops. And then does Mr. Calhoun respond? Yes, he responds uh, within seconds at the same time with as soon as I saw it. Moving on then to 314. And the message continued in a new bubble, 1257 p.m. saying knew I should send you a text. And then does Mr. Smith respond? He did at 1258 p.m. saying I'm surprised it took so long period in a few weeks now would have covered it. And just based on the Following messages, I believe he was trying to say snow. And then what does Mr. Calhoun respond? At 1258, Mr. Calhoun responds with, I was kind of hoping that it would hurry and snow. And then he responds again with another message saying, me too, from what was said, LOL. Moving on to 315. Uh, Mr. Calhoun then at 1258 PM sends a message saying, but that means I'll be in the clear. And then uh, about 30 minutes later, or so at 1.20 p.m. on October 2nd, 2019, uh, Brian Smith responds with, there is something else I must tell, period. I will talk next week, period. But keep an eye on this about any leads, period. Can't talk, period. Not alone. And everyone is upset that I'm carrying my phone around on vacation. And then does Mr. Uh, Calhoun respond? He does with gotcha, comma, we'll get together soon. And then 316. Uh, Mr. Smith responds back at 1339, 39 p.m. on the same day. I get back Tuesday noon, but if I go into work a few hours, then they won't take it as a lead day. And Calhoun responds at 18, 12 hours, so about five hours later with, okay, keep me in the loop. When you um, located these messages, did you uh, eventually interview Mr. Calhoun? Um, I interviewed Mr. Calhoun um, after the reading the text message. The text messages on um, Mr. Smith's phone. I did not have the uh, messenger, uh, the Facebook messages at that point. Okay. Um, I want to move uh, uh, fast forward to January of 2020. Um, did you, um, were you listening to jail visits and jail calls between Mr. Smith and anyone visiting him? Uh, yes, I did. And, um, <clears throat> how are those calls pulled? Um, so at the, in the DOC, um, they have what's called a secure phone system. That's how, um, inmates, uh, make phone calls from the time they get to the jail. Um, they can get on the phones there. And it's linked to a program called Securus. The phone calls are recorded. Um, any phone call made at the jail or a visit is recorded, and um, the person making the phone call is notified. Of each, notified, excuse me, each time they make a phone call that they're being recorded. And um, so, then, how do you listen? How do you listen to these? Um, so, at, at the police department, as an investigator, you can sign up for a Securus uh, login, and you can sign into Securus, and you can search by inmate name or inmate number or by phone number and find phone calls made by that person or visits. Did, um, did you listen to uh, any particular call between Mr. Smith and his wife, Ms. Bislin? Yes, I did. 
And um, did you hear any conversation of note? Yes, I did. And what was that conversation? Uh, the conversation I heard um, was Ms. Bislin on the phone. I recognized her voice and she Wait, asked. Just for the record, are you reviewing your notes? to request? I, I apologize. I am reviewing my report, ARS 78, um, my, my police report. Just, just noting my prior objection. Which one? Uh, Pre-trial judge. Okay. It's overruled on the basis that I, I did pre And go ahead. Uh, what was what was the date of the conversation that we were referring to? Um, so um, it was on November 30th, 2019. Um, and it, the, the visit there happened between 0733, so 7.30 a.m. and 7.57 hours. And what was the what was the exchange that you noted between Mr. Smith and Ms. Bislin? So Bislin said, uh, so you did not sleep with the women you killed. And Smith said, not those two. And then business said, but you did with others. Yes, you may. Objection sustained. Judge, or, sorry, uh, Detective Lee, moving on. Um, you be, had before said, you before you proceed, the jury is to disregard the last two question and answer, the previous question and answer. Okay. Now you can proceed. Okay, sorry, Judge. Uh, going back briefly to uh, Miss, your inner, your discuss. Apologies, I'm going to get a word out here. Going back to your conversations that you had and your investigation regarding the involvement of Mr. Calhoun, um, do you had? Did you have any evidence beyond the messages that Mr. Calhoun was involved in this investigation in, in any way with Mr. Smith in this particular incident? Um. All I had was what I saw in the messages and then um, based on the messages and, and then speaking to him, what I did was I obtained warrants for Mr. Calhoun's um, AT&T data, much like Mr. Smith's or phone data. I don't recall if it's AT&T, I apologize. Um, and then and then basically reviewed those the same way we did Mr. Smith's to find out locations. Did you also uh, obtain a search warrant for his Facebook records? Yes, I did. And based on your review of his records, his Facebook records and his AT&T records, did you determine that? Um, there had been a number of items deleted. Uh, yes. Do you know, based on his phone data, if you were able to determine whether or not Mr. Calhoun was at either um, the hotel, uh, the Marriott, uh, at the same time Mr. Smith was, or um, at, wait, wait, that was the end of the question, sorry. Uh, based on his data, he was not at the at that location at that time. How about uh, the mile 108 of the 0.5 of the Stewart Highway? Uh, no, he was not. His phone was not there at that time. Okay. Um, now moving on to um, the Shell Station video, you said that you had contacted the Shell Station and, and given them some time frames that you believe there might be video related to this case. Yes, I did. And did it actually take several uh, times of requests to Shell Stations to get a variety of video to try and determine the time frame that you might need? Yes, it did. Ultimately, were you able to give them a time frame that provided evidence in this case? Yes, I did. And then where did that time frame come from? So early on, we were asking just uh, as a guess, based on what we'd heard from Ms. Castler, we knew it was sometime around and sometime in September, but we don't exactly when. Um, as we started getting the phone data and location information, we were able to pinpoint when Mr. Smith was at the Shell Station based on his phone records um, and text messages. Therefore, we were able to ask for a specific time period at the Shell Station. And looking in front of you at State's Exhibit 329. Yes. And do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And uh, what is it? Uh, this is, um, have it up there, yeah, another screenshot from the text messages from Mr. Smith's phone, um, specifically. It's, uh, it says inbox and it says from, and then it's um, a five digit number, 2205-6883, Mr. Phone, Mr. Smith's phone number, excuse me. Uh, the date is 9-19, September 19, 2019 at 0432 AM hours. And uh, it says that it was read and it says, hi, it's Capital One. Did you just try to make this purchase with your card ending in 1914? And then it says shell $1, and then the basic text back yes or no to protect your account, kind of like a warning from a bank account. 
And did you use this as information also to assist you in trying to narrow down a time frame for Shell Station video? Yes, I did. Okay. At this time, Judge, I'd move to admit uh, Exhibit 329. Okay. To admit. And I'd like to publish it for the jury. Yes. <laughs> Is that the text message or that you're referring to in Mr. Smith's records? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. And then um, ultimately, you obtained Shell Station video from this particular time frame, correct? Yes, I did. And did you review that video? Yes, I did. And did it review, did it show Mr. Smith at the Shell Station on uh, September 29th, 2019? Uh, September 19th, 2019, Sorry. yes. September 19th, 2019. Yeah. And what was the time frame of about which you saw Mr. Smith at the Shell Station video? Uh, around 4 a.m., 4, 4.30 a.m. Did the video from the Shell Station, was it in different uh, pieces? Yes, it was. And what was, how are the pieces um, divvied up? Um, so there are four different, three or four different cameras, um, including the entrance at the register. Um, there's a camera looking at the kind of the ice box freezer area where the drinks are and the chips. And then there's a camera kind of off in the distance. You can see an ATM in the, in the building. Can you describe what you see Mr. Smith do on the videos? Uh, yes. When he, when he walks into the store, he goes to the uh, refrigerator aisle and selects, it appears to be two beverages. Um, he then walks over to the chip aisle and is kind of browsing for a little bit and then selects a bag of chips. Um, he then walks over to the register and appears to pay for those items. And then he walks over to the ATM and spends a good amount of time, probably about five minutes at the ATM, um, ultimately walks out of the store and then um, several minutes later comes back into the store and appears to make some sort of transaction at the register. So for purposes of trial, the state has marked uh, the video as exhibit uh, 330. Have you reviewed that video? Yes, I have. And is it a fair and accurate representation of that video? Yes, it is. Is it a combined set of videos for purposes of trial and expediency of playing the videos? Yes, it is. This time I'd move to admit exhibit 330. Objection. Okay. Admitted. You may play it. Just give me one moment to switch over to play the video. And before we play this, um, we discussed earlier that there is um, the videos are in chunks um, and that we've made a compilation for expediency. Is there you did discuss there is a break um, that Mr. Smith went outside for a while and then came back in. Does this video cut that out for expediency? Yes, it does. Okay. This time now I'll move to play exhibit 330.
So, Detective Lee, I want to talk to you um, a little bit about um, some of the lab requests that in this particular case. Was there a, um, oh, sorry, before I get to that, um, on this, these uh, videos, um, or the, the video of the time and date that you got um, from the shell station that the APD obtained from the cell station and you reviewed, was that consistent with the time frame? As Special Agent Perry said, the defendant's phone was at the shell station on September 19, 2019? Yes, it was. And um, is it also consistent with the report from Ms. Kassler that um, Mr. Smith went into uh, the Shell Station to uh, attempt to draw money for an ATM? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, on the lab requests that you um, requested in this particular case, um, did you work with multiple agencies to decide what labs would and would not be tested in where? Yes, I did. And how did that occur? Uh, we had a meeting with uh, myself, the district attorney's office, with the FBI, with a state lab uh, representative um, and other other detectives to decide what needed to be submitted. And um, ultimately, were some items then submitted to the FBI crime lab and then some to the state lab? Yes. Okay. Or APD lab, excuse me. Yes. At that time, we had our APD lab. Um, since then, it's all become state lab, but APD lab, state lab, FBI lab. Okay. 
And um, what was the purpose of the number? We heard from uh, Mr. Inks earlier today that a number of items were sent um, from the truck to be fingerprinted. Um, and also possibly uh, some of them determined if blood was present. What was the what was the purpose of sending that large amount of items from the truck to the a APD's crime lab? Um, at that point, the investigation it was to help us identify who else might have been in the truck. At this point, we know whose truck it was, and we know that Brian Smith was in the truck, but we wanted to see if it could help us identify anybody else in the truck. I want to talk a little bit about um, the items that were sent to the FBI uh, crime lab. One of the items that was not sent to the crime lab was the carpet that was taken from the Marriott 323. Yes. And what were the considerations that went into why that did not get sent off to the crime lab? What we consider with this piece of carpet is that um, in the videos, um, you see that Miss Henry is, is bleeding, but she's not bleeding profusely. She's not bleeding a lot. And it does appear that a lot appears to be going onto the carpet. Um, it also took into account that this is a hotel room. And, and by the time that we got back to the hotel room to process for evidence, there had been multiple, I believe eight people had already stayed in that room and the room had already been turned over several times since then. Um, so those were some of the factors we talked about in that, for that item. I want to talk to you then next about um, working with the FBI crime lab at Quantico. Um, there was um, female, initially reported female DNA found in the carpet sample in the original report that Ms. Gregor sent out, correct? Yes. But it was not identified in her in her first report, is that correct? It was not. And um, in order to facilitate additional testing, what involvement did you have in the case? So what I did at this, at this point, we had sent off uh, samples to uh, the University of North Texas in order to obtain a DNA profile for Veronica Balchuk. And uh, my part in, the, in this process was that I had, uh, contacted uh, North Texas and found out what we needed to do in order to get that DNA profile to the FBI so that we could use for comparison. And what that entailed was that I had written up a search warrant that was assigned by a judge granting us uh, permission to get that DNA profile and submit it to the FBI lab for comparison. And is that what you did? That it is did? what I did, yes. Okay. Um, did you also, um, moving on from the client, from the labs, did you also, um, review the defendants, continue to review the defendant's cell phone records? Yes, I did. Okay. And, um, did you locate any other images, um, that appeared to have maybe taken place in, uh, the Marriott hotel room? Yes, I did. I'm showing you or in front of you is exhibit 332. Yes. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what is that an image of? Uh, these are, appear to be, the, it's the hotel room, and um, what you can see is that it appears to be taken point of view from the bed. You can see uh, two feet uh, um, on the bed as, the, as if the photographers kind of sprawled out on the bed, and you can see uh, what appears to be a female with probably about shoulder length, maybe light colored, dirty uh, blonde hair, um, wearing what appears to be a nightgown and facing away from the camera and uh, doing something with some clothing on the couch. And is that a uh, fair and accurate representation of the image that you located on Mr. Smith's phone? Yes. Or images, I should say. At this time, I'd like to move to admit exhibit 332 and publish. Same objection as the, as I stated pretty earlier, media judge. Uh, approach.
the objections overruled. And so can I publish, Judge? Yes, you may. Okay. It's admitted and you may publish. <clears throat> So, uh, Detective Lee, can you show us what, tell us what we're looking at in Exhibit 332? Yeah, this is like I said, this is, uh, appears to be the same room. The bed is in the same position with the couch, the table, and the art. And then um, you can see two feet on the bed. Uh, it appears that the photograph is being taken by somebody laying on the bed. And then the female with kind of shoulder length hair appears to be reddish, blondish color, and some sort of nightgown uh, messing with some clothes over on the couch here. And why is this um, of particular relevance to the investigation? Uh, because it, it appears to be the same room as uh, where the incident with Catherine and Henry occurred. And did uh, Mr. Smith in his interview talk about another female at the that he had brought to the hotel room? Yes, he did. Okay. And did he describe that female as having shorter hair? Yes, he did. Okay. Um, I want to show you, or actually, could you please look then at the exhibits 333 through 339 that are in front of you? In general, do you recognize those photos? Yes, I do. And in general, what are they? Without going to the, in, into each one, what in general are those photos of? These are photos, again, on the left side would be screenshots from uh, videos and images um, that we obtained from Ms. Kassler. And on the right side would be photos taken by the anchored police uh, throughout the investigation. This time, and are those a fair and accurate representation of both the images from the SD card and, and the images taken by the APD during their investigation? Yes, they are. This time, I would move to admit exhibits 333 through 339 and publish to the jury. 333 through 339, you said? Yes. Um, counsel, is there any, is 333 subject to any previous rulings by me? These are all previously these are all previously admitted photos, Judge, I know or admitted. images that have been screenshot or still shot. But you may not understand what I'm asking. Okay, um, is it allowed? To oh, I believe. I think it's. Fine. I think three 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 is um, cut enough of an image that it's that is not um, going to be in in I guess in violation of your previous order. Does the defense have any input on this? Um, not on that issue, just I, I, I defer to the court on that ruling. I mean, obviously these are relevant to my earlier pretrial motion about the video, so I have that same objection. Objections overruled, uh, the exhibits are admitted and you, you may publish. Okay. So um, see it's exhibit 333, it has two images, Detective Lee, what is the image on the left? Uh, the image on the left is a screenshot from one of the videos uh, where Mr. Smith's foot is on Kathleen Joe Henry's neck. And the image on the right? This is a photo of the same foot, uh, right foot, um, the other one of the right foot, and this is an image that I took of Mr. Smith's foot. Then going on to exhibit 334. This is on the left is a screenshot from the video. Um, at the bottom, you see the stomach of Mr. Smith and the legs straddled over the body of Kathleen Henry with the hands above her, her neck with the, what appears to be the, the string of cord. And on the right is the image I took of Mr. Smith's uh, midsection, stomach, chest, arms at the airport. Exhibit 335. On the left is a screenshot from the video with Mr. Smith's right hand um, on the neck of Kathleen Henry. And on the right is an image I took at the airport of Mr. Smith's leg. 336. This is uh, in the, one of the images of the hotel room from the night with uh, Kathleen Henry looking from the living room area through the kitchen out to the front door. And you can see the black bag with the blue trim and 
mm -hmm. uh, bottom at the bottom here, the photo next to the table. And on the right is the image taken by a crime scene of the bag with the blue trim and bottom in the back of the pickup truck, brown, or excuse me, the black Ford Ranger. Exhibit uh, 337. Uh, this is the same image uh, looking from the living area um, from the images of, uh, obtained from Ms. Castle looking out to the door of the hotel room. And on the right, there's two images. The top one is looking back the other direction from the hotel room main entrance, looking through the kitchen into the living area. And um, the bottom one is a picture of the carpet area, bathroom, the kitchen, and the carpet that was covered by crime scene. Exhibit 338. Uh, 338 on the left is a street, uh, one of the images um, that is uh, censored to cover up Kathleen Henry's uh, naked body on the floor. You can see the bed in the top left corner. And on the right is a, a view from the hotel room looking at the corner of the bed that you can see in the image uh, looking in the direction of the bathroom um, of the hotel room taken by a crime scene. And then exhibit 339. 339 is uh, one of the images um, of the luggage cart with uh, Kevin Henry on it in, uh, wrapped in the white blanket with a black uh, duffel bag with some sort of right, uh, white writing or emblem on the side. And then uh, on the right is the picture taken by a crime scene of uh, the, the bed of the Ford Ranger with a similar looking bag um, in the toilet. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for the detective. Detective, um, you spent a good portion of your testimony today and a good portion of it the first time you testified referring to the woman in the video as Kathleen Henry or Kathleen Joe Henry, right? Yes. And that is based solely on your, well, I won't say solely, but that for you, you don't have any personal knowledge of Kathleen Henry. You never met her, right? And not that I know of. I don't know if I ever met her. Or not. Right. You, you may have interacted with her in the past, but you don't have any affirmative recollection. No, I do not. You don't have any experience with her um, prior to this case that would inform your ability to view the video and say, hey, based on my personal knowledge, that is Kathleen Henry. No. Your statement today, you know, coming from your head is looking at the DMV photo, comparing it to the video and saying, I believe that's be Kathleen Joe Henry. Yes. Right. Um, which is something that the jury can also do and will be asked to do in their deliberations, right? Yes. And you did identify and locate people who did know Kathleen Henry uh, prior to this case, right? Uh, yes. And you had... Well, during this case. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm sorry. They knew her prior to this case. Oh, prior. Yeah, yes, yes. And you had some of your investigators go and meet with those people and talk to them? Uh, yes. And ask them about when they'd last seen her? Yes. Also went through the Facebook messages to see when she'd last been contacted or communicated? Yes. Uh, but none of those investigators contacting those people brought a still image or a screen cap or anything to ask them, hey, do you recognize this person? Uh, not that I'm aware of. And then you discussed uh, a little bit on direct your decision not to send the hotel carpet out to get DNA tested, right? Yes. And you said that decision was based on the fact that it had gone through eight or so uh, different guests and cleaning cycles. Uh, yes. And as well as from what you viewed in the video to be not significant bleeding. Yes. Now, you've been trained in and you have experience in the collection and testing of DNA, right? Uh, not doing it myself, but the process, yes. Right. You haven't tested, but you were aware of how the testing works. Yes. And what they test for. Yes. And you're aware that DNA can be transferred to a surface in many different ways, right? Yes. Not just blood. Yes. It can be um, hair. Yes. Right. Skin. Yes. Blood. Yes. Sweat. Yep. Urine. Yes. Fecal matter. Yes. Saliva. Yes. Vaginal fluids. Yes. So those can all leave DNA on a carpet like we saw in the photographs and the videos yes and based on your review of the videos that wasn't the entirety of the interaction depicted in the videos right there's some parts where it starts and stops right oh uh, yes and there's some time that's simply at least as far as you can tell not shown on the videos right yeah uh, potentially yes uh like for example 
there's no video showing anybody putting a body onto a luggage cart, right? No. You didn't see that happen. No. You didn't see how the body was removed from the room. No. You didn't see how it was moved around the room. No. So you don't know what parts of the body and what bodily fluids would have touched any part of that carpet, right? No. And were you aware at the time you were doing this that the hotel between guests only vacuumed the carpets? I was not, I did not know what their exact process was. No. Did you ask them? I did not specifically ask them. Somebody might have, but I did not. Because a vacuum wouldn't necessarily pick up blood or other fluids that just soaked through the carpet, right? Not necessarily, but it could. And as we saw in the collection of the carpet from Mr. Smith's residence, the allegation there is that that had happened a year prior, right? Yes. And you still collected that carpet, right? Yes. And you don't know how many people had been in and out of that house. Yes. Right. And you did. You were not aware of, well, actually, during your interview or interrogation of Mr. Smith, he talked about cleaning the carpet, right? Yes. So you were aware that cleaning had occurred there? Yes. And it had been significantly longer than the approximate month that we have in the hotel room that that carpet had sat there, right? Yes. And that was still collected and sent out for testing? Yes. <clears throat> And then when you uh, you talked a little bit about your interrogation of Mr. Smith, and you're, are you the one who set that up and organized it? Uh, yes. I, I mean, I was the, the lead on the case and ultimately would be the one leading the interview and interrogation, yes. So it was your decision to interview him at the airport? I had a say in it, yes. And it was your decision to contact him and interview him or interrogate him after he'd gotten off the plane? Yes. So the timing of the interrogation was at least in part your decision. Yes. The place of the interrogation was at least in part your decision. Yes. Um, and we heard some testimony here. That we had a uh, an image, and I'm not going to ask it be redisplayed. Uh, but image three 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 two that had the the two images of sorry exhibit three three two the Exhibit that had the two images of the woman. From the yes. Your testimony is not that you believe that to be Kathleen Henry. Uh, I don't believe that's Kathleen Henry, no. Your testimony is that maybe the short haired woman from that Mr. Smith talked about during his interrogation. Yeah. My testimony is that it could be, but I'm not positive that it is. In your interrogation, you told Mr. Smith that he had, uh, that you had looked at hotel video and that you know there was no short haired woman. I did say that, yes. And that was not true when you said it. We'd be looking. I told him we were looking at video, and, and I had not at that time looked at any video, so I had not seen any short-haired woman at that time. So when you outright said or implied to him that you'd looked at video and knew that there was no short-haired woman, that was a, a lie. Yeah. I, I, yes. And that was an interrogation technique. Yes. Uh, similarly, with the way station video, you said that you'd looked at. You also had not seen any way station video that showed his. I, I did not speak department. on the way station video. That was Detective Bell. But at the time that was said. You had not viewed it and you were not aware. I had not viewed the video, no. It viewed it and could say that. that was I also, personally did not view that video at that time. That was also an interrogation technique to make Mr. Smith feel like his, uh, there was no point in denying it, right? By that time, by that time, what I did have was enough for me to believe that it was Mr. Smith based on what we had at that time. So, yes. Right. And there's a difference between what you have in your head and what your investigation has shown and what you choose to tell the person you're interrogating. Absolutely. And that is a very thought out decision to try to get them to keep talking and to tell you it was a strike that that's an interrogation to get them to keep talking right yeah we like them to keep talking and to make them feel like they should keep talking and tell you as much as they can we like them to know that they have the opportunity to talk and that is their opportunity to talk yes right um well aware that you're planning on using that against them and you would love them to confess well, he, he heard that when I when I gave him the warning at the beginning. Yes. Yeah. Any, anything he says, yes. And that's your plan going into it is ideally to get a statement from the subject that confirms your investigation. And Absolutely. Cinches it for you. Right? Absolutely. And you went into this interrogation of Mr. Smith with that goal. Yes. And how soon after the SD card was collected from Valerie Kessler, did you get involved in the investigation wasn't presented to you i was the first one so the way it worked is patrol officers went to the doctor's office patrol officers contacted her viewed what they viewed called my sergeant 
And then my sergeant called me that same day. So that's how quickly I got involved. And at that point, you had been told that there had been an SD card collected, right? Yes. Um, and you would, you were not aware at that point that it had, in fact, been a phone that was stolen? I was not aware at that time. No. Now, had you been in the field and the SD card had been in the phone that Ms. Kassler had and you watched it be on that phone, would you have, all, would you have collected the phone as well to keep to uh, secure that data of the phone that, it, that the SD card had been in? Would I, I'm sorry, can you rephrase that? Yeah, so you're aware that the officer who went to collect the SD card viewed some of the contents on the phone that Ms. Kassler had, right? Sure. Uh, and at the time, believed it was Ms. Kassler's phone that she was showing the data on, right? Yes. Then popped out the SD card. The officer took the SD card, brought it back to the state. Yes. Had that been you, would you have asked Ms. Kassler to also secure her phone to try to collect data from that phone? Uh, I mean, I, I can't. I might have asked her, is there anything else on, I mean, she, the way it was told to us is that she found this SD card and put it in her phone. So I had no reason, I would have no reason to believe there was anything else on her phone based on what she told us. Because all you can do is work off of what, what, what we know. tells you, right? Absolutely. You don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Kassler originally stated that um, the first date of a picture or video that she observed was September 3rd. I believe she said the same time. Yeah, she said gave me a date range, and I believe the third was said. Yes. Do you have your report in front of you? Uh, yes, I do. Can you just tell me? I, I'm assuming you're referring to my first interview with Ms. Castro. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at page one of five, and it would be the second page of that. So, first full paragraph, Castler was referring to the card. Yes. Yes. So two of five, basically. Page mm -hmm. page two of five. Uh, and in that, you note that she stated that the first date on the card was September 3rd, right? Yeah, she said the first date on it, it was September 3rd. But then you took possession of it and you reviewed the card and all the videos seemed to be from September 4th on, right? Uh, yes. There was no video that was clearly from September 3rd. No. And there may be an implication there then that not all the videos have been transferred, right? uh potentially or not all the images have been transferred <laughs> that could that could be yes um but that question was ever asked to miss castler no <laughs> oh and you noted you were asked on direct uh, you obtained warrants for you know, Calhoun's phone and you tracked the location of the phone, right? Yes. And you were asked, um, was he ever at the uh, the Marriott Hotel? Was he ever at mile 108 of the Seward Highway? You said no, right? Uh, as specific, specifically speaking about the times in question, right. no, he was not there at those times. I don't know if he ever went to those spots. but and, and, and you say he, but what you mean to say is his phone. His phone, phone. yeah. I think I said that earlier, his, his right. phone, yes. And he could have left his phone at home and been anywhere. Oh, absolutely. Because your phone doesn't know where you are. It only knows where it is. Mm -hmm. So if you take it with you, it tracks your location. Yeah. If you don't take it with you, it doesn't. Also, but also speak, may I add on to that if you don't absolutely. mind? Um, the text message conversation made it appear. I, I had no reason to believe he was at the hotel based on the conversation. He's reaching out to him and he doesn't respond for five hours. And so. And that's also assuming that Ian Calhoun is the one writing the messages. Absolutely. Which you also don't know. Yeah. So you know where the phone was and you know the phone was sending messages, but you don't know who had it. I, I can tell you that when I contacted Calhoun, he, well, I don't know how much I can say on that, but I believed it to be his phone based on the investigation. Right. Yeah. But you don't have personal knowledge of where he was on those dates and times, only where his phone was. Um, you weren't with him on the dates and time, right? I wasn't with him, no. That's all I have, Judge. When you contacted Mr. Calhoun, did you actually take possession of his phone? I did. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the difference in uh, the carpet samples between um, the carpet found at the hotel and the carpet found at the house. Did uh, the crime scene team inform you that the carpet, after it was pulled up at the hotel, had a lot of blood on it anywhere that they could visually see, or stains that they could see? No, they told me they couldn't see anything. As opposed to the carpet that was pulled up from Mr. Smith's house, did they tell you about what was indicated on that particular carpet once it was pulled up? Yes, blood. Okay. Would that also be a reason why the carpet was not mailed off? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, your ID or your ID of Ms. Henry and your certainty in this case. We have Mr. Smith's cell phone records indicating his cell phone was at the hotel on September 4th, correct? Yes. And we have his cell phone records indicating that he... Judge. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have Mr. Smith's cell phone records? Yes, we do. Do we have uh, Mr. Smith's cell phone records indicating that they were anywhere near mile 108 of the Seward Highway? Yes, we do. And do we have Mr. Smith? Uh, you spoke to Mr. Smith, correct? Yes, I did. Did Mr. Smith admit to dumping a body on the Seward Highway? Yes, he did. And uh, was that body identified as that belonging to Kathleen Joe Henry? Yeah, yes, it was. No further questions, Judge. And I believe there is that um, one stipulation that now we're going to provide to the jury. Yeah. Um, you can step down, Detective. Thank you. You're done. Thank you. Folks, the parties have entered into several stipulations in the case. One of them is relevant now. And I have an instruction for you. The parties may agree that certain facts are true. In this situation, instead of presenting evidence, the parties will present a stipulation, which is an agreed statement of facts. You must accept stipulated facts are true. The parties stipulate that the videos and screen captures obtained from Shell, Walmart, and McDonald's exhibits 318, 319, 322, 323, 324, and 330 are authentic. No foundational witnesses are needed from those business entities in order to verify the date, time, and authenticity of the images portrayed. Next. At this point, the state rests its case, Judge. All right. Does the defense have witness to present today? Um, possibly, I can we approach? Yes, you may. Or would it be better to take a break and? That's about to do that. Let's take a 15-minute break for us. Be seated. Let's talk about the remaining scheduling. For one thing, uh, there aren't any more jury instructions to come in from the state, are there? I don't believe so, Judge. Okay. We need to uh, get the defense's proposed, the objections and the, any proposed additions by, can you, can you have them in by beginning of the day tomorrow? Okay. You, you wanted to tell me something about defense case scheduling. Yes, I'm wondering if we can take, so we're kind of in a weird time right now in the day. Um, I was hoping to have some time to sit with Mr. Smith to discuss with him whether it's going to be his choice to testify uh, in his defense. Okay, so would, would that be the only witness if there if the decision is made to testify? It, right now, Judge, yes, I have the one exhibit that I'd like to admit, and then it would be Mr. Smith's. We're back in the record in State versus Brian Smith, 3 a.m. 199901 CR. And Mr. Smith is here. Counsel are all here. The jury is right now waiting back in the jury room. Um, Thank you. 
Does the defense intend to present any evidence? Uh, Judge, we have one document that we'll be submitting. Uh, goes along with the stipulation we provided to the court. Yes. Earlier. Uh, so I should do that in front of the jury. But um, it is Smith or Smith's decision not to testify in, uh, in this case. And there wouldn't be any other witnesses. No, Judge. All right. So after we do the stipulation and we get on the record the evidence in that you want in, you'll be close rest in your case. Yes, Judge. Mr. Smith, I previously advised you that you have the right to choose whether you're going to testify or remain silent at this trial. Your attorney just told me that you have decided not to testify. Is that your voluntary decision? Yes, it is. Okay. And you've had time to talk that over with your attorney? Yes. Has anyone promised you anything or threatened you in any way to convince you to make that decision? No. Are you sick or under the influence of alcohol, drugs, or medications right now? No. You seem clear to me, and I find that you understand your rights, so I find a knowing, voluntary, and intelligent decision not to testify at this trial. Waiver of the right to testify. Um, next, before we bring the jury in, I want to talk a little bit with the folks in the gallery. Um, I don't know, you probably weren't all here for all the instructions I previously gave the jury, but I gave the jury one instruction. It goes as follows. This is an important instruction. The instruction I'm looking for is the one that says the jurors cannot base their decision on sentiment, prejudice, passion, public opinion. They're forbidden from facing their decision on that. And if it appears that they might have been influenced by one of those factors, um, that can theoretically be a basis for having to do the trial over again. I haven't noticed anything I've been watching and I haven't noticed anything happening so far that leads me to think that, that there's an effort being made to get jurors to make a decision based on those factors. But I know people feel strongly about the case and I know people really want to identify with particular points of view that are important points of view. I just want everybody to understand that if it does appear that jurors' passions are being um, there's attempts being made to raise jurors' passions, that I'm obligated to step in and try to prevent that. And I might have to do so if that were to happen, which it hasn't, <laughs> but if it might. I might be required to ask people to leave the courtroom, for example. So I wanted to announce that. I'm also going to tell jurors when they come in, I'm going to remind them of that jury instruction. The council have anything more that they want me to address on this topic, either side? Nothing from the state, Judge. No, Judge. Let's uh, let's bring the jury in, please. Pardon? Please rise, the jury.
<coughs> Please be seated, everyone. <coughs> Welcome back, members of the jury. We've got uh, everyone with us we need to have it here in order to resume the trial on the Brian Smith case. It's 21 minutes after one. And when we, just before we broke <coughs> for our, or excuse me, <coughs> for our break, uh, the state had rested their case. So it's now the defense's turn and I, uh, I have another stipulation for you. this time. The prosecution and defense stipulate that the attached records from the Department of Correction were prepared in the no normal course of their official duties. And the statements contained in the letter from Perry R. Bauer are true and correct recitations of the information contained therein and are admissible. I think uh, that's a puzzling stipulation unless somebody summarizes for the jury what the Letters say. Yes, Judge. I'm wondering if I can just uh, publish it by reading it. You can do to the jury and then submit the hard copy to the master clerk. Y yes, you may. Uh, um, so the letter that will be in the record will say, "Dear Mr. Ayer, in response to the subpoena issued to me on February 8th, 2024, I reviewed the records for Valerie Kastler, Kathleen Joe Henry, and Veronica Abouchuk from 1-1-2019 to 12-31-2019. During this period, Ms. Kastler was placed into DOC custody once." intake on 7-14-2019 and released on the same day. During this period, Ms. Henry was placed in DOC custody four times, intake on 1-7-2019 and released on the same day. Intake on 1-12-2019 and released on 4-25-2019. Intake on 4-28-2019 and released on the same day. Intake on 5-18-2019 and released on 6-12-2019. During this period, Ms. Abouchek was never placed in DOC custody. Her last incarceration period was in 2010, intake on 8-15-2010 and released on 8-22-2010. I've attached a copy of the relevant portion of the location history listing for each. Please advise me if there are any additional issues you need me to address at my appearance or if I need to provide any additional records. Sincerely, Perry R. Bauer, Chief Time Accounting Officer. May I approach to hand it to Mr. Clerk? Yes. Without you, the defense rests. All right, thank you. That means you've now heard all. <clears throat> unless does the state have any rebuttal, the state stipulated to this, so there would be no rebuttal to the <laughs> evidence just presented. Okay, that means you've heard all the evidence in the case. The next phase is going to be. Uh, I'm going to read you additional instructions, and uh, and then you'll hear closing arguments, and then you'll be retiring to deliberate. So you can expect that you'll be in deliberations tomorrow, which means on days you're in deliberations, you go 8.30 till 4.30, Monday through Thursday. If you're still in deliberations on Friday, you go 8.30 till noon on Friday. If still in deliberations on Monday, back to 8.30 till 4.30. Um, so please plan your schedules accordingly. And uh, I'm about to release you for the day. I want to remind you of one instruction. <clears throat> We've heard a lot of evidence at this point. And I want to remind you of something I read to you early on. When you consider the evidence, you must not be influenced by sentiment, prejudice, passion, or public opinion. You must base your verdict upon a fair consideration of the evidence. Okay. Send you home and see you bright and early at 8.30 in the morning. I've got uh, your jury instructions coming first thing in the morning. 
we will take a break, obviously, at some point before probably uh, probably fairly early on in the morning to discuss whether there are any issues with jury instructions that need to be addressed. But I take it you are prepared to do closing arguments tomorrow? Sure. I was a little surprised when you had the jury come back at 8.30 since we haven't discussed jury instructions. Yeah. So I would normally do that before closing. Yeah, I, I normally do that before closing as well. Um, well, let me have a seat. Let me ask this. Does the defense anticipate any significant objections to the state's proposed in instruction? Uh, I don't judge. I want to argue them one more time, but I, I don't. Okay. Then we, they may have to wait a few minutes, but uh, I doubt they'll have to wait very long. Uh, does the defense anticipate submitting proposed instructions that are um, more than a few? No, I, I think it might be. Um, no, I don't. Okay. I, I won't call them and tell them to come at 9.30 or 10, then we'll, we'll have them come at 8.30 and while we talk about instructions, we'll let them drink coffee or do what they need to do. The only thing I can think if your law clerk or your judicial assistant are putting is the